For those of you who, uh, if you missed it, there's a piece in today's Science Times, New York Science Times, called A Neuroscientific Look at Speaking in Tongues. And the, uh, the headline above the, um, the fMRI scan says, Evidence for a Religious State. So I mentioned that to you. You might want to take a look at it. It's the work of Andrew Newberg. And it, uh, one of the commentaries does say that uh, it's not clear what the finding says, but I'm just bringing it to your attention as a, as a, as a matter of interest. Um, we're going to go into the morality issue, some of the morality issues this morning. Um, um, and we'll be hearing from Sam, from Jim Woodward, from Mel Connor um, um, initially. And then we have some words from Richard Sloan later. We have uh, Paul Churchton to emulate Dan Dennett. So if people could keep to um, the shorter time scale, that would be excellent, and that would move us along quite quickly. Uh, I'd like to start with a, with a brief clip from um, The Root of All Evil, which is Richard's, uh, Richard Dawkins' movie that was shown in England a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Rich, we actually talk, we were originally talking about um, showing this here, uh, but in the interim period, it's, it's all over YouTube and everywhere else and so on, so it's, it's, it's widely available, although it wasn't necessarily intended to be, but... I do want to see this. I do, do want you to see this clip to begin with. So let's just watch this. All right, let's all pray together. Father, in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. We exalt you here this morning, Lord God. Everything that's within us wants to give you praise and glory and honor because we are so grateful for what you've done. The for New us. Life Church in Colorado Springs is a bastion of American religious conservatism. Thank you for transforming our lives. Thank you, Lord God. I've come to try to understand why what I see as irrational faith is thriving and why it's attacking science. We pray and everybody says, Amen. Welcome to the United States. Thank you very much. Pastor Ted Haggard has a hotline to God, to George Bush. A staunch Republican, he claims he has a weekly conference call with the president and has also rubbed shoulders with Tony Blair and Ariel Sharon. Well, that was really quite a show you gave us uh, today. A fair bit of money seems to have been spent here. Yes. I wanted pe people to be able to worship and enjoy it and then be in a setting where the speaker is close to them. That's why it's in the round. And so they can be up close to me and so I can look at them. Well, it's certainly very effective what you do. I mean, it seemed to me to have all the, the arts of... I mean, I was almost reminded, if you'll forgive me, of a sort of Nuremberg rally. I mean, it's uh, such incredibly... Well, I don't, Dr Goebbels would have been proud. I of, don't know anything about the Nuremberg rallies, but I know lots of Americans think of it as a rock concert. What can I give to you that you don't already have? When I prepare a presentation, I don't prepare it to get a group of lunatics to come in and just say, oh, yes, Pastor Ted, you're just so wonderful. I believe everything you say. I would be opposed to that. Here the Bible says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This is talking about us. We've been chosen for, what's that word there, everybody? Obedience. Say it out loud. Obedience. Okay, so we have been chosen. Every person needs, at the center, some sense of meaning about existence. It is life and death to us. It makes us who we are. Yet most of us, as we grow up and become responsible adults, accept that life is complex, that we live in a world of subtle shades, not sharp black and white. I worry that these born-agains are being persuaded to return to childish certainties. The only truth they need is God. God as interpreted for them by their pastor. You have been set free from sin. Think about it. Everybody knows that we believe the Bible is the word of God. And today I talked about love your neighbor as yourself. 
Now, I didn't have to produce evidence, sociological evidence or psychological book. evidence. You, the book how, is true. How can you say they're asked to think for themselves and they're told everything in this book is true? Because they don't have to believe that. I mean, the evidence yeah. I presented, you can go and read this book, it says one thing, that book says another, yeah. that book says another, that book... Well, the evidence the I can present is we've got a book written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors on one subject, and it doesn't contradict itself. Well, you it can not You can't give me two, two experts in certain areas that are in the same generation, in the same area of study, that don't contradict themselves. That's the beauty of science. We have, we have lots of evidence, yeah. and the evidence is all the time coming in, mm -hmm. constantly changing our, our minds. Right. And uh, whereas you have one book, which you say right. doesn't change, exactly. that's not getting to think for themselves. And we've all decided as a group to go into the holy place. True or false? True. 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 Everybody say true. True. All right, then. That's the vote. But my biggest concern is that evangelicals like Haggard are foisting evident falsehoods on their flock. The evangelicals are denying scientific evidence just to support Bronze Age myths. And then, of course, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We fully embrace the scientific method as American evangelicals. And we think as time goes along, as we discover more and more facts, that we'll learn more and more about how God created as the heavens and the earth. The scientific method clearly demonstrates that the world is four and a half billion years old. I mean, do you accept that? Yeah, you know what you're doing is you are, you are accepting some of the views that are accepted in some portions of the scientific community as fact. Where in, where, in fact, your grandchildren might listen to the tape of you saying that and laugh at you. You want to bet? Sometimes it's hard for a human being to study the ear or study the eye and think that happened by accident. Uh, I beg your pardon, did you say by accident? Yeah. What do you mean by accident? That the eye just formed itself somehow. And who says it did? Well, some evolutionists say it Not did. a single one that I've ever met. Really? Really. Oh. You obviously know nothing about the subject of evolution. Or maybe you haven't met the people I have. <laughs> but you see, you, you do understand. You do understand that this issue right here of intellectual arrogance is the reason why people like you have a difficult problem with people of faith. I don't communicate an air of superiority over the people because I know so much more. And if you only read the books I know, and if you only knew the scientists I knew, then you would be great like me. Well, sir, there could be many things that you know well. There are other things that you don't know well. As you age, you'll find yourself wrong on some things, right on some other things. But please, in the process of it, don't be arrogant. We just had a rather disconcerting experience. We were just packing up our stuff ready to go, and he suddenly drove up in his pickup truck and said, get off my land immediately, I'll have you thrown in jail, and I'll seize your film. And he then said a very curious thing. He said, you called my children animals. Afterwards, we worked out that what he must have meant was that I talked about evolution. He thought I was saying that his flock were animals, which, of course, in a sense, I was, because all humans are animals. But Haggard's approach is to Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I thought you might just like to see that um, in terms of a few uh, foundational ideas in terms of humility and piety and morality and so on and so forth. So um, let's start this session off. I don't want to comment any more on that. We can go into it later if you want to. But let's start this session off with um, Sam Harris, um, who has been introduced already. But as I said before, the best-selling author of uh, most recently Letters to a Christian Nation. Thank you, Roger. Well, I want to uh, try to focus us again on this question of uh, the relationship between morality and religion. Because I, I think, as I said before, I really think this is the, the keystone myth in our society that keeps religion in such good standing among otherwise rational people. Um, 
And, and so I really think this is the, the place where science should apply uh, pressure even more so than on, on questions of evolution and, and um, uh, other obvious points of conflict. Uh, and this is, it's, it seems to me quite simple. I mean, this is not, the argument here is not complex. This is not rocket science. Uh, but paradoxically, it's, it, I mean, it's both easier than rocket science and harder. It's easier because there's nothing complicated, really, that needs to be understood uh, to, to run the argument that we don't get our, our uh, morality out of religion. But it, it is harder than rocket, scientist, apparent, uh, rocket science, apparently, because you can rather often find rocket scientists uh, who don't see uh, that we don't get our, our morality out of religion. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a problem of discourse. It's a problem that, that certain ideas in, uh, remain in good standing and remain immune to criticism. Now, previously, I spoke about the problems that beset any claim that, that uh, re any religious doctrine is true. Um, these being that, that if religion really were a, a genuine branch of, of intellectual inquiry, it would function by the same rules. We, we would have people's certainties about their religious doctrines scaling with the evidence and the arguments that could be marshaled in support of those ideas. And, and we, fu we fundamentally find that that's not what's going on in religion. Uh, so briefly, my argument on that subject is that uh, where we have reasons for what we believe, we have no need of faith. And, and where, we, where we don't have reasons or we have bad ones, uh, we, have, we have really lost our connection to the world and to one another. Uh, and, and here, I'm not talking about faith in the sense that Paul Davies was talking about, the faith that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, or the faith, the faith that the, the laws of nature are, in some sense, uh, rationally apprehendable. I mean, this is, I'm talking about faith in, the, the faith which allows people to accept gratuitous uh, and very specific claims about the way the world is. The, the, the universe is 6,000 years old, a book is the perfect word of the creator of the universe, etc. Uh, but there, there's another way that religious people rise to the defense of God that has nothing to do with claiming that their religious doctrines are true. Uh, the claim, rather, is that the re religious doctrines are useful. Uh, and uh, the way they're imagined to be most useful is, is in providing a foundation for morality. The claim really is that religion makes people moral. And the fear uh, on the part of uh, millions of religious people in this country, not just people like Ted Haggard, but far more moderate people, uh, is that without faith, we will lose something essential to us in the moral sphere. We will lose uh, any purchase upon durable reasons to treat one another well, uh, to find meaning in our lives, and we'll just, be, we'll just plunge into some kind of state of nature where, where selfishness and and, and the, the purest creaturely antagonisms will be the norm. Uh, there's a political version of this morality claim, which is that our, our, our society has been founded on Judeo-Christian principles, uh, and the implication being that without these principles, there'd be no way to write just laws. Uh, so this is, this is ubiquitous, as you all know. Uh, the first thing to point out is that it should be rather obvious to everyone that we can find reasons to treat other human beings well, uh, to help them in times of suffering, that don't require uh, that we believe anything preposterous about the nature of the universe. We don't have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin to help people. Uh, and I think, it's, uh, I think perhaps Richard pointed this out, it is rather more noble to help people purely out of concern for their suffering than it is to help them because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it or will reward you for doing it or will punish you for not doing it. Uh, so the problem, one problem with this linkage between religion and morality is that it actually gives people bad reasons to help other human beings when good reasons are available. And I, I think this, this has to be pointed out. Uh, now, the, the idea that we get our morality out of, our, out of religion begins to look immediately suspect when you actually read the books. And this has also been pointed out. Harry Croto pointed this out, I believe, and as did Richard. Uh, you know, you, you, the truth is that not even fundamentalists like Haggard can take the God of the Bible at his word, given how sadistic he is in certain books of the Bible, like the Leviticus and Deuteronomy and uh, 
uh, Exodus and Second Samuel. I mean, this is the, the God is just so the, the vision of life that is preached uh, in those books is so needlessly horrible. It is so um, uh, hostile to the ba- to, to to creating a, a sustainable society where where basic human happiness is uh, is even possible. That if you're going to draw your to-do list out of a book like Leviticus, you're going to make Mullah Omar of the Taliban look like Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I mean, this is just not this is a this is not a vision of life that even our fundamentalists subscribe to. Uh, so they have even our fundamentalists have have effectively edited the Bible by their neglect of many of its passages. Uh, and so, and how do we do this? Well, we edit the Bible based, we cherry pick it based on our own intellect, our own ethical intuitions, and a larger conversation about ethics and and human happiness that has developed in the last two thousand years. Uh, and I believe Pat Churchland also pointed this out. I mean, so we, when we go to the Bible and we see that a moral precept like the Golden Rule is a brilliant distillation of, of some of our ethical impulses. We, we do that on the basis of, of our own intuitions uh, and this larger conversation, and then we reject the barbarism. And this is, so, so our, our own ethical wisdom is the guarantor of the wisdom we find in the Bible. And this also, I think, has to be pointed out to religious people. And as Richard pointed out, there's no question that our, our morality precedes our humanity even. I mean, we, we have experiments where mice are shown to be more disturbed at the suffering of familiar mice than unfamiliar mice. We know that, that monkeys will uh, withstand painful shocks to, to uh, or will, will uh, withstand starvation to keep their, their cage mates from receiving painful shocks. We know that chimpanzees show obvious concern over, over uh, uh, fairness in the allocation of food rewards. I mean, these are the kinds of findings you would expect if our morality were somehow an emergent property of, of biology. Uh, but let me tell you what, briefly what, uh, what I think is most wrong with this linkage between religious, uh, religion and, and morality. Uh, and this, I think, gets to some of Joan Roughgarden's concerns about how we can have a, a, a generalizable morality that is uh, uh, based on reason that, is, that doesn't plunge us into any kind of moral relativism. Uh, it seems to me that the only rational basis for morality is a concern for human and animal suffering, that for the suffering of conscious beings. If we, if we could build computers that we thought were conscious, we would have moral obligations to them as well. Insofar as a system can be ma- made happy or be made to suffer, we have moral obligations toward that system. Uh, and this is why we don't have moral obligations toward rocks, because we don't think there's anything we can do to make rocks suffer. Um, and this makes sense of why we have gradations of our moral concern. If it is right to be more concerned about the experience of a chimpanzee, for instance, than the experience of a cricket, it is right because the, the complexity of a chimpanzee nervous system is a, it, it provides more of an opportunity for happiness or suffering. Uh, so those gradations that we, I think we have some very serviceable moral intuitions about, about what, who to worry about in the world, in the animal world. And, and uh, this makes sense of why we, ge- we tend to privilege uh, human beings over uh, most animals. The problem with religious, uh, with a religious foundation uh, for morality is that religious conceptions of right and wrong systematically separate questions of morality from the living reality of human and animal suffering. Religious people tend not to focus on suffering and happiness. This is why we have a nation that can debate gay marriage as though it were the great moral issue of the time, when genocide and, 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 and massive forms of suffering are occurring on a daily basis. Um, uh, I'll give you a case in point that I brought up briefly yesterday. This, this uh, uh, the fact of stem cell research, as many people in this room no doubt are aware, stem cell research is one of the most promising lines in, in biology to generate medical therapies. Uh, and it is not being funded at the federal level uh, for reasons that are religious, but for re- because, because we have this idea that based on uh, rather vague uh, notions of theology, 
that in every fertilized ovum there is a soul. And you can't privilege the, the interest of one soul over another, even if one is in a petri dish and the other is in a, a man with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, it's, a lot has been said in this conference about science not being able to answer questions of morality. Well, I think this is a question of morality that science has answered. Uh, if you look at the details, if you look at the, the human embryos that are destroyed in stem cell research, uh, what is a three-day-old human embryo? It is a collection of 150 cells. Uh, that may sound like a lot of cells to, 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 to lay people, it does, but there are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Uh, now, we, it seems to me, if, if our concern is about suffering in this universe, uh, it is rather obvious that we should be more concerned about killing flies than about killing three-day-old human embryos. Now, this, this may sound like a very provocative claim. I would argue that it shouldn't if you look at the details. Now, many people, of course, will argue, well, the difference between a fly and a three-day-old human embryo is that a, a, a three-day-old human embryo is a potential human being. Uh, this runs into problems. Every cell in your body, given the right manipulations, every cell with a nucleus, is now a potential human being. I mean, literally, every time you scratch your nose, you have committed a holocaust of potential human beings. Uh, so the, the argument for, for a cell's potential doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, but let's, let's take this a little bit further. Let's say we granted that every three-day-old human embryo has a soul worthy of our moral concern. Uh, there are other problems that await this, uh, this uh, description. First of all, embryos at this stage can split into what we call identical twins. Uh, now, is this a case of, of one soul splitting into two souls? Embryos at this stage can fuse into what we call a chimera. There are many people in this room could have developed in this way. Now, I, I suspect that there are theologians trying to figure out what has happened to the extra human soul in such a case. Uh, it, it's time we realize that this arithmetic of souls doesn't make any sense. It's intellectually indefensible, but it is morally indefensible, given that these notions really are prolonging the scarcely endurable misery of tens of millions of human beings. And because, uh, because of the respect we accord religious faith, not even just people of faith, even advocates of stem cell research, uh, accord this the, the faith respect. Uh, we can't have this, this dialogue uh, in the way that we should. So I submit to you that if, if you think that the, the, the interests of a blastocyst, a three-day-old human embryo, just may trump the interests of a little girl with spinal cord injury or, or a person with full body burns, uh, your moral intuitions have been obscured by religious metaphysics. Uh, and this is a kind of blindness that is very well subscribed in our society, and it's a blindness that goes by another name. It goes by the name of religious faith, and we have been cowed into respecting it. So in conclusion, I just want to point, up a, point out another issue. Uh, I want to return to this question of truth, and the truth of religious doctrine, because it's interesting to notice that even if we got our morality out of religion, even if religion was supremely useful, this would not be an argument for the existence of God. I mean, just, just imagine, imagine if atheists were really reliably immoral and religious people were, the, were exquisitely moral. Would this argue for the specific truth of Christian doctrine or the doctrine of Islam? Faith can, could function like a placebo. The idea of God could be perfectly vacuous and yet incredibly useful. I think there's much evidence to suggest that it's not, but even if it were, this is not a, an argument for the truth of religious doctrine. And this is, this is surprisingly hard for people to see, uh, and it is amazingly easy to see when you change the subject from God to uh, some ordinary proposition. I mean, just imagine if I claim that I'm a... Uh, I'm one of the fastest people who has ever lived, and I could have won many Olympic gold medals uh, in track and field had I only tried. Uh, now, if you ask me why I believe this about myself, uh, uh, well, let's, let's say I maintain this even in, contrary to the evidence, even in the company of, of Olympic sprinters who can run circles around me. Uh, 
You asked me why I believe this. What if I said things like, well, uh, being the fastest man alive has brought me immense satisfaction? Or what if I said, uh, you know, that the, winning a gold medal in the Olympics is one of the highest human honors, and just imagining those medals around my neck uh, just, just makes me feel uh, fantastic and gives my life meaning. It, it's pretty clear what is wrong with these answers. I mean, this is the, the, the fact that it would be nice if something were true, or the fact that believing it to be true gives you positive, some positive effect in your life is not a reason to believe that it is true. And we readily understand this in every area of our lives. And this is why we have phrases like wishful thinking and self-deception and delusion. And so my argument to you uh, across the board is that a person who believes that an invisible and all-knowing deity is taking an interest in their lives and occasionally doling out good fortune to them should not be free to say that he believes this because it gives his life meaning, because it makes him a better person, because he values the experience of going to church on Sunday. These are, these are non sequiturs. Uh, and so just in conclusion, I want to say that I, I think we we have to acknowledge that, that these two approaches to morality really are in competition. Either we can focus on questions of human happiness in a, in a very fine-grained way, bringing all of uh, the last 2,000 years of human insight and human discourse to bear, uh, and have a 21st century conversation about morality, or we can have a conversation born of the first century as preserved in the New Testament, or the seventh century as preserved in the Quran. And it is amazing how many intelligent people find this to be a difficult choice. Uh, the challenge for us is to, is to really expose time and again that the choice is that. The, cho we, the, the opportunity is for human conversation. And it can either be modern uh, with everything useful brought, brought on the table, or it can be fixated in the past out of deference to certain books. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I just want to um, stay up here. Um, I, I, what I'd like to do this morning actually is move very quickly through a couple of these talks. And so if you could hold your questions until we've heard from Jim Woodward and Mel Connor, um, maybe make some notes and so on, then we could have a, a quick panel discussion with them. Um, Jim is the uh, Kepfley Professor of Humanities at Caltech. Um, he, he works on um, philosophical and normative aspects of causation and explanation. He's just written a paper recently with John Allman, who couldn't be here because of a voice, he lost his voice, um, <clears throat> uh, on moral intuitions. And Jim's most recent book called Making Things Happen won the, I see there's a typo, who won the Lakatosh Award from the London School of Economics. Um, Jim Woodward. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Kent, could you come and do multimedia things well, while we're talk while we're waiting for this to happen? If you have any questions for Sam, we could do that very quickly. Neil. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Sam, there are plenty of things people do that don't make sense, but of course they're otherwise harmless to others and might be mildly harmless to the person who thinks it or believes it, but um, no one makes a big deal of it. If the religious community, instead of going away, morphed into a system, systems of philosophy that made no attempt to say things about the physical world that are easily verifiable by the methods and tools of science and, and rational inquiry. And they only simply talked about, you know, how to treat your neighbor, how to, you know, maybe give you some place to think you might be when you're dead. Um, what's the harm in that? If, it, if, it, if we're going to try to be realistic about how effective any such movement that you, that you want to support can be, 
Mm. Either you're going to say one day there's going to be no religions in the world, or one day there's a profile of the various religions that have changed to the point where they don't trigger anybody's reaction, anyone such as your reaction. Right, right. Um, well, I'm just not hopeful that they can change. They can be so chaste in their, in their proclamations about reality so as not to conflict with with those of us who are trying to, to speak sensibly about reality and, and to, to shape public policy that's based on sensible conversation. So for instance, you know, what do you do when you find out that your neighbor's religion has proscribed uh, drawing a caricature of a certain historical figure and has prescribed it in such terms that you can get 100,000 people in the, in the town square calling for the deaths of newspaper editors and cartoonists for drawing, you know, for publishing pictures of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, it seems to me that really is a deal breaker. I mean, this is just you know, free speech and rational uh, understandings of civil society just have to win. You know, it's just there's no accommodation with that. And what was so scandalous about that that episode is that. Uh, we really caved in. I mean, we, we practiced self-censorship. Censorship. We, we chastised Denmark for uh, publishing those, those cartoons, and New York Times wrote editorials you know, about, about it. And we're not recognizing uh, the bigger picture here, which is uh, these, these are, this is an, an eruption of medievalism that is sanctioned by the, the fastest growing religion in the world. And here again, I'm, I'm focusing on Islam. Uh, uh, almost randomly. I mean, I'm, I'm worried about religion in totality, but uh, it's, it, you have to get, if you're going to dignify the claim that one of our books is not just a book, but is in some sense an infallible document, you are, it seems to me, always going to be held hostage to the contents of the book. And, and it just so happens that these books are, are, are engines of intolerance. I mean, you just, you know, 100 years from now, someone can pick up the Quran or the Bible and find reasons to be every bit as obnoxious as Ted Haggard or worse, uh, and those reasons are continually refreshing themselves. So unless we undercut this notion that the Bible and the Quran are not at all like the plays of Shakespeare, uh, I just, th I don't think the problem can go away. Yeah, I'm going to have to be an engine of intolerance because yeah. I'm hostage to time, so... Um. <laughs> okay, well, well uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Um, so as Roger said, I'm primarily a philosopher of science, and I have some interest in um, uh, moral decision-making and the mechanisms that underlie moral decision-making. I'm not an expert at all on the relationship between science and religion. And in fact, I'm afraid that I haven't read a number of the books that are being discussed at this conference. But um, what I, I have been uh, listening to what's been said, and I've, I've had certain... Um, uh, reactions, uh, and one of my main reactions has just been surprise at some of the things that are being claimed. And I wanted to begin just by saying a little bit about that, and then I'll uh, segue into the uh, a very brief uh, sort of moral philosophy part of the talk. So, um, in, in the past couple of days, I've heard uh, the following claims, and I'm caricaturing slightly, but uh, uh, here they are. Uh, there's the claim that God doesn't exist. Uh, there's a the claim that belief in God or religious faith or perhaps particular religious doctrines are responsible for all sorts of bad outcomes that we don't like, like uh, suicide bombing or interference with scientific research. And then uh, there's the at least implicit suggestion it's a good practical workable strategy to try to ameliorate these bad outcomes by converting the world to secular humanism. Um, so the thought is that there's something like a straight line from I, I take it from those three propositions, from one to two to three, the thought, I guess, is something, uh, you can explain to me if I'm wrong about this, that religious faith is irrational, irrationality, of course, is bad, and this badness in belief leads to badness in action. So we have, boy, a real simple, straightforward explanation of why there's suicide bombing. Um, now, I'm an atheist. Uh, I've been an atheist since about, I grew up in a religious family. Uh, but have been an atheist since about age 10, uh, very unapologetic about it. But I don't think that the truth of atheism uh, generates uh, answers by itself to those claims two and three. Instead, very specific uh, empirical evidence is required. Now, about two, uh, the claim that um, um, religious faith or particular religious doctrines uh, lead to um, the various bad outcomes that we've been talking about, well, I think there are just some 
basic uh, sort of methodological points here that need to be made. Um, I think, I, I, I mean, I, this is one of the things that frankly surprises me about this con conference, is that you should bring to claims like two um, the ordinary scientific standards of evidence and assessment that you would insist on in other contexts. And I'm afraid I haven't seen much of that uh, uh, at this conference. Um, a general point is I think if you have something that is varying, like the incidence of suicide bombing, I mean, 50 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was relatively little uh, suicide bombing. 100 years ago, uh, I suppose, uh, though I'm not very informed about this, uh, uh, I would assume less. Uh, you can't, I think, very adequately explain this variation in incidence by appealing to something that's constant, like the content of the Quran. And I don't think either it's a very good explanation. It isn't something that would be um, accepted by any very um, thoughtful social scientist, uh, simply to appeal to what the bombers themselves uh, say. You've got to find factors that um, co-vary uh, with uh, those who are or are not suicide bombers, and you need to formulate and exclude uh, alternative hypotheses. So it's not good enough just to have the hypothesis that, say, uh, the content of the Quran is responsible for uh, suicide bombing and pile up all sorts of evidence, say, by quoting the Quran and quoting the suicide bombers themselves. Uh, in support of this, you need to think about what the alternative explanations would be, and you need to systematically exclude these. Now, my, I'm not very far from being an expert, of course, on suicide bombing, but my intuition would be that all sorts of local factors, facts about particular uh, political actors, uh, particular historical contingent uh, events, are going to be better explanatory variables than uh, just appealing to the content of these people's uh, religious faith. And I would assume that the same thing is true for the rise of the Christian right. Um, there's no question that we're undergoing uh, throughout the world uh, what looks like a sort of rise in um, religious fundamentalism. It's, there's no question that it's disturbing, alarming, etc. But I think that what we need to do is to try to understand the particular social and economic and political factors um, that are responsible for this. Um, we need to understand the, uh, uh, the choices that various uh, opportunistic political figures have made uh, to um, uh, encourage this sort of, sort of thing. And I think that's a better, uh, a better strategy for really understanding what's going on and effectively dealing with it than um, uh, simply uh, sort of fulminating against uh, uh, religion in general. So what about three? Uh, just to remind you, three is it's a good strategy to try to ameliorate the, these bad outcomes we don't like by uh, converting the world to secular humanism. Well, I have a couple of things to say about this. Uh, first of all, good luck. Uh, there's, uh, you know, like, what planet are you guys living on? Uh, this just isn't going to happen. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's an empirical assumption here, and the empirical assumption is that uh, the secular behave better than the religious. And as far as I know, um, there's no serious evidence for this claim. Um, for all of the uh, bad things that come out of religion, one can uh, cite on the other side, uh, Hitler, Stalin, uh, Mao, Pol Pot, uh, uh, et cetera. These were secular regimes. They also did uh, terrible things. Um, I've heard it claimed at this conference that nothing good or morally worthwhile has come out of religion. Uh, I'm not a religious person, but uh, I think it's simply an empirical fact that, for example, the civil rights movement uh, in the United States uh, drew heavily on uh, religious inspiration. Uh, if you look at the history of the uh, abolitionist movement, both in the United States and in uh, Britain, you'll find uh, religious figures and religious arguments uh, figuring centrally uh, in that. So that's just an empirical fact. And, um, you know, as, as scientists, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't deny it. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I think in some sense that if the causes of the kind of behavior that we don't like are local in particular, this is good news because it makes the problem more tractable. Uh, we can ad try to address these. Uh, we can't, uh, if, if the solution to the problem requires that we somehow engineer the end of religion, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think the situation genuinely is pretty hopeless. So I hope that that uh, absolutely isn't true. Um, in general, I think a better strategy for trying to um, deal with these, the issues, the, the, the sort of political and moral uh, uh, fallout of um, 
uh, religious belief, political and moral fault that we don't like, a, a better strategy is to try to better understand the psychological mechanism that underlie admirable and immoral behavior, and which I would assume are shared alike by both believers and uh, the secular. So that's the first part of my talk, and I'm sorry if I sounded a little polemical, but uh, I really do think that, that um, the importance of approaching these questions about, you know, it's one thing to argue about the existence of God. You can, people make all sorts of a priori philosophical arguments one way or the other about that. But when you come to these questions that I called two and three, these are empirical questions, and they have to be invest, addressed in a responsible um, empirical way. Okay, so. In the second part, good without God, can we be good without God? Uh, again, I would emphasize this is an empirical issue, can't be resolved a priori or by intuition, but I, are, I do think they're grounds for cautious optimism. Um, after all, um, cooperative behavior uh, presumably has been a feature of uh, behavior in the human species uh, since uh, the origins of Homo sapiens. It greatly antedates uh, the uh, monotheistic religions. This certainly suggests that we don't need these religions uh, for uh, cooperative or moral behavior, uh, the decline of religious belief in Western Europe, this is already something that's been um, uh, mentioned uh, over the last century, it certainly has not been accompanied by any great explosion of immorality. Uh, again, this is uh, grounds for cautious optimism. There's a long philosophical tradition of putting morality on a non-religious basis. Um, just in the early modern period, you have Hobbes, you have Kant, sort of, although people argue that uh, really, Kant is just uh, the categorical imperative and so on is really just uh, a, a certain set of uh, Protestant religious ideas uh, uh, redescribed re in another kind of language. You, but you also have figures like Mill and Rawls who are certainly secular. Um, th these, so there's a, a long-standing sustained intellectual attempt to uh, put um, religious, uh, to put morality on a, on a secular, non-religious basis. Um, and I think there's some, although philosophers like to focus, perhaps understandably enough, on the points at which the moral uh, recommendations of these different approaches diverge from one another, I think if you, <coughs> if you look at the larger picture, uh, you see a great deal of convergence on what's recommended. You know, ideas about <coughs> Human rights, human equality, etc., uh, figure in uh, all, all of these. Uh, uh, all of these figures. Um, I think the weakness of uh, conventional uh, uh, moral philosophy, including these great historical figures, is uh, the absence of any convincing motivational story or a realistic psychology uh, to go along with the normative um, uh, pronouncements that they make. So, uh, you know, Kant uh, suggests, for example, that you should. Uh, uh, the, the, the only action, or at least the, the kind of action that has greatest moral worth is action done for the sake of the moral law uh, in itself. Very unclear what this means. What does this really translate into in terms of facts about human motivation? Uh, a certain kind of utilitarian uh, suggests that we should be um, unconditionally uh, 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 altruistic all the time and act directly for the greatest good of the greatest number. Uh, it seems dubious that, act, that actual real life human beings have any such motivation. So I think what's missing in the, um, the traditional uh, approach is, as I say, a realistic psychology. And I think this is one of the points at which um, uh, empirical information and informed uh, empirical investigation about morality uh, can really be uh, quite uh, helpful. So just, just to say it again, uh, uh, in a slightly different way, um, one, one of the things one can do with empirical research is to ask the question of what sorts of motivations and preferences the human beings in fact have. And one, I take it, long-standing um, worry uh, that people have had, and I've even heard it expressed at this conference, is that without religion, um, people would behave in an entirely uh, selfish way. They would behave uncooperatively uh, when, when it is to their advantage uh, to do so. And this, of course, raises the question of um, what sorts of preferences, motivations uh, do people uh, uh, actually have. And in fact, there's a substantial amount of, uh, of um, evidence coming out of uh, uh, the, the kinds of experimental games that are uh, investigate, investigated in uh, experimental economics uh, that people do have uh, non-self-interested preferences. So for example, uh, people cooperate even in one-shot games um, when uh, defection is the dominant strategy. Um, even when the uh, self-interested thing to do would be to defect, even when 
you don't, it's not a repeated game, so you don't get the kind of repeated effects, um, the, 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 the kinds of effects on reputa reputation, reciprocal altruism, et cetera, that would be uh, present if you had a, a repeated game. They cooperate uh, even under conditions of anonymity, uh, et cetera. I think it's a really interesting uh, empirical question what the structure of the preferences are that uh, account for this behavior, and I think it's something that we don't understand very well. Uh, at this point, and I would also relatedly what the, what the underlying neural mechanisms are, but that the behavior itself is not um, entirely self-interested seems to be, um, uh, to me, um, the, the, the empirical uh, evidence seems to be really clear. And, and uh, just to mention one piece of work uh, of, of a more neurobiological sort um, uh, in this context, um, Rilling and others uh, recently did the following. They uh, imaged um, uh, human subjects in a sequential prisoner's dilemma. That is, the first player moves, and then the first player moves first, and the second player knows what the first player's move is. Okay, so um, certainly if people are entirely self-interested, the dominant strategy um, is to defect. Um, in um, imaging uh, uh, investigations, you see when the, when the uh, first player moves cooperatively and you image the second player, uh, uh, you see, and the second player also cooperates, uh, you see um, uh, activation in standard reward areas of the brain, like the dorsal striatum. And interestingly, you get more activation when the player is playing with a human partner than, with the, than when the player is playing with a computer, even though the reward is the same in both cases. And what this seems to strongly suggest is that people are, so to speak, getting independent utility from the fact that they're cooperating with another human being. And I think this is uh, encouraging news. So uh, to the extent that people, this, is, this should be non-self-interested preference, preferences, to the extent that people have non-self-interested preferences, we need to understand better what the structure of these preferences are. Uh, to what extent are people unconditional or altruists? To what extent are they conditional cooperators? And if they are conditional cooperators, uh, what sort of conditional cooperators are they? May make a great deal of difference it, whether they're the kind of conditional cooperator who um, begins with the assumption that the other player is gonna defect and only plays cooperatively if one has reason to believe that the other player is gonna play cooperatively too. That would be one possibility. Another possibility is that we're wired up in such a way that at least in a lot of cases, we think the default strategy is to cooperate, and we only stop cooperating if we see the other person uh, is not cooperating. So the structure of these preferences, I think, is really quite crucial to understanding, um, get, getting a sort of a realistic understanding of the motivational uh, kind of bases that, that we have, and, and, and that in turn, uh, I think, is really our, our best hope for devising moral and political theories that are actually workable and rest on uh, realistic assumptions about human behavior. Um, in addition to these, the general questions of what kinds of preferences do we have, there are very interesting questions about the conditions that elicit uh, the preferences. There's very interesting questions about the distribution of, of the preferences across the population. Obviously, people are not all the same. Some people are more self-interested than others. Uh, all of these are things are, uh, all this is information that is, I think, um, highly relevant to um, moral and political decision making, and um, uh, there's really beginning to be a very uh, rich body of, uh, uh, of research about it. Now, whenever one talks about the uh, possible relevance of empirical information to uh, moral and political theorizing, um, well, of course the question that's always raised is, what about the yawning gap between is and ought? Uh, you can't derive uh, an ought from an is. And I'm certainly not claiming, for example, that we can decide whether uh, uh, abortion is moral or immoral by doing an experiment of some kind. But as I've already, I think, somewhat illustrated, uh, empirical information can be relevant to moral decision making in other ways. Uh, it can provide information about what the motivational constraints are. You don't want your moral and political theory to rest on assumptions about the motivations that people have. Uh, where those, where those uh, assumptions are just empirically false. 
uh, empirical information uh, about the experience of those who live with a moral practice and its consequences uh, can be certainly highly relevant to moral decision making. Uh, we talked uh, very briefly about torture um, uh, in this connection yesterday. Um, abolition, the, the abolitionist movement is uh, highly, uh, I think, instructive in this connection too. Uh, yesterday, uh, Susan uh, uh, Neiman challenged us to say, well, uh, what is it that's actually empirically learned when um, uh, it was decided that uh, slavery is a bad thing? Well, if you look at the history of the abolitionist movement, lots of things were empirically learned. Uh, for example, one of the things that was decisive, as I understand it, in uh, persuading the uh, British uh, government and the British public to um, uh, end uh, British involvement in the slave trade was simply empirical information about the kinds of conditions under which slaves were being uh, transported and the enormously high uh, death rates, uh, et cetera, the incredibly uh, cramped and filthy conditions, et cetera. So I think that um, uh, moral decision making, when it's uh, uh, good moral decision making, is going to be uh, informed at every point with um, uh, empirical information. Now, finally, um, there's been some talk at this conference about the idea of putting morality on a rational foundation. And I think this is a great idea if all that it means is that you want a secular, not naturalistic, non-religious uh, story about where morality comes from. But I'm afraid that uh, at least sometimes this is understood or construed in a much narrower way. That is, one, the assumption is that we should think of morality as grounded in reason with a capital R, where this is narrowly construed as in opposition to emotion, affect, um, uh, etc. And of course, there's a very long-standing philosophical uh, tradition of thinking about the origins of morality in this way. Um, Kant uh, uh, it, and, and I suppose Hobbes in some ways would be uh, major figures in this uh, uh, tradition. And uh, I think that this idea of, of putting morality on a rational basis in this uh, narrower sense is um, it's an idea about which I'm pretty skeptical. Uh, I think one of the lessons of recent empirical work is that conscious rational deliberation and rule following is much less central to uh, morality and moral decision making and having a good moral character, et cetera, uh, than many have, have supposed. Instead, things like affect, implicit learning, automatic processing um, are extremely uh, important. We saw this illustrated in the talk we had yesterday about uh, 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 racial and gender prejudice. Um, and I think this is not just an abstract philosophical point, but it bears on the uh, whole question of how we are to address uh, people who uh, uh, hold uh, beliefs or even moral beliefs that we think are misguided in some way. Uh, I think the strategy of trying to change their minds by carefully to explaining to them how stupid and misguided and irrational they are um, is uh, unlikely to be uh, effective if just employed by itself. It's an overly rationalistic strategy. And uh, with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Could you um, also take a pew? Um, oh, sure. Yeah. And we'll um, bring, we up turn Mel, that off? <laughs> bring up Mel Connor. <clears throat> what I'm trying to, what I'd like to do this morning, because of the interest of time and the way things tend to happen yesterday, is to just uh, move on to Mel Connor very quickly, and then we've got the three of them together, and we can perhaps have a, a discussion about morality based on that. So, um, do you need to change this? You've got your own things up there. So, M Mel is um, professor of anthropology, neuroscience, and behavioral biology at Emory, um, and author of what is really an absolutely classic text. Um, for those of you who know, it's called The Tangled Wing. Um, one of the people who was going to be here, Robert Sapolsky, um, who is now in the snow somewhere, giving an, um, a convocation address and regretting it deeply, um, <coughs> uh, called The Tangled Wing the nearest, uh, and Mel the nearest thing, the thing we have to a poet laureate of be behavioral biology. So, um, poetry from the master. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, by the way, Roger, unlike some noble people spoke yesterday, I wrote those books for money, among, <laughs> among other reasons. Did, did you, and uh, did you, did I you? have to say I was not successful in attaining ah. that goal. <laughs> uh, 
So I thought I was an atheist, and, and then this morning I went down to the cliffs and I saw the Pacific Ocean, and I fell to my knees. <laughs> Just kidding. But I, I did notice Darwin's face and the you know, foam on the waves. Uh, I, um, I've been very interested in what uh, people have had to say at this meeting, but I have to say that with a few uh, notable exceptions, the, the uh, viewpoints have run the gamut from A to B. And uh, I, uh, I mean, you know, should we bash religion with a crowbar or only with a baseball bat? <laughs> are, are, uh, are people of faith completely out to lunch or are they just having lunch at their desk and pouring sacramental wine into their keyboards? I mean, it's, this, this is about the, uh, uh, the extent of the debate. And uh, so I'm going to try and uh, add something to that. I would, would associate myself with what, uh, uh, with what Jim Woodward just said. <coughs> um, I am a uh, dyed-in-the-wool faith head, which, uh, using uh, Richard Dawkins' uh, uh, evocative phrase, dyed-in-the-wool faith head. But um, the wool in my head was, was thoroughly and completely bleached uh, in my first semester in college by a, uh, a, a wonderful course in um, Anglo-Saxon philosophic analysis. <clears throat> um, I got a D plus and the course changed my life. I have, I'm just past my 60th birthday and I have not had a flicker of faith uh, since then. However, and, um, one of the things I did Along the way was go to medical school. I never practiced medicine, but I did have a lot of encounters with patients. And one of the things I was taught was it, it is not the job of the physician to take away the patient's hope. So in the con context was, yes, you tell the truth. So I, I'm sorry, sir, but, but you have terminal cancer and uh, you might die next year or the year after. I'm not sure. But no, doc, I think I'm going to be OK. It's going to be fine. Uh, and, and when you have that exchange three times, you stop because it's not the job of the physician to take away the patient's hope. Uh, truth is fine, but you don't have to batter somebody with it. And, and I was happy to hear that, that Richard Dawkins agreed with me. He said he would not tell somebody uh, his views if they were on their deathbed. I find that quite inconsistent, actually. Uh, as many people have pointed out uh, during the meeting, um, we're all on our deathbeds as soon as we attain consciousness of, of the fact that we're going to end up in the same place. Um, and, uh, and, and I would suggest to you that, that all of you, uh, all of us who, who speak to the public <coughs> about, about science, uh, are physicians in a way, and that it's not the job of the physician to take away the patient's hope. OK, so <coughs> um, with that as an introduction, um, this is uh, the, the foundational moment in the religion of my childhood. Uh, the, those are ten, you know, five, last five of the Ten Commandments. Mo the, the expression, this is a Rembrandt, the, the expression on Moses' face is, uh, means um, this is going to be the marketing problem from hell. And the, <laughs> uh, the, the Tenth Commandment, which is very long, uh, is long because it's the one that, that tries to tell you to control your thoughts. And somebody was nervous when they, uh, God was a little nervous when he, when he wrote that one, so he, he made it longer. Uh, that's the one about coveting. <coughs> um, so here's another depiction. Uh, I chose rays coming out of Moses' head. I, I chose this to, uh, uh, to, to remind me to tell you that, that uh, uh, being a member of this group and entails a certain amount of suffering. Uh, I, the, the Hebrew word for rays of light uh, is, is the same as the, the word for horns. Michelangelo uh, depicted Moses with horns. Uh, s some very large uh, boys, non-Jewish boys in my neighborhood in Brooklyn <coughs> uh, went looking for my horns from time to time. Uh, and I, I, you know, I understand that religion can do bad things, <coughs> really. Uh, and I, uh, I, uh, as for the Holocaust, I, I grew up uh, I learned to talk during the Nuremberg trials. I was told my parents postponed my conception until the closing of the gas chambers. <coughs> uh, I, I grew up with Holocaust survivors around me, uh, even though it was in the United States. And uh, so I'm not going to take a back seat to anybody on Holocaust paranoia. I, I'm going to have a front row seat at the Holocaust paranoia event. <coughs> uh, 
And I do resent to a certain extent the use of, uh, of Holocaust history to advance a simplistic attack on, on religion. So this is a, a <coughs> from a 17th century uh, Haggadah showing the drowning of Pharaoh's army in the sea, uh, a Christian depiction of the same thing uh, by Lucas Cronach the Elder, 16th century, and a Muslim depiction of the same thing, uh <coughs> uh, 18th century uh, Iran, um, funnily enough. And uh, of course, if, uh, if half people in the world uh, believe this, you, you think, well, let's go looking for chariot wheels on the bottom of the Red Sea, and archaeologists have indeed done that, including some very religious ones who very much wanted to find them, and they, uh, ha their search has, uh, has so far been fruitless. Uh, now you can't prove uh, uh, um, th that, that, uh, that it didn't happen, absent uh, <coughs> uh, evidence is not evidence of absence, but uh, we're pretty, I'm on pretty firm ground when I say that that didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, and that's an empirical uh, uh, question. Now, when <coughs> I went to the, uh, um, uh, to the, uh, live with the Bushman of Botswana, where I was doing research on uh, the hormonal mediation of lactational infertility, among other subjects, uh, I became an apprentice trance dancer. Um, and this was after my conversion to, to uh, uh, British philosophy. And I have to say that it didn't uh, entail a change in faith, just that change in behavior. The trans dance, women sit around the fire. This is the morning after an all-night dance. Uh, women sit around the fire, they, they clap and, uh, 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 and sing uh, in sort of yodeling, uh, eerie voices. Uh, men dance around the circle until they go into altered states of consciousness. And then they can heal by laying on hands and going through a particular ritual. I, I put this up to show you. Uh, this, this, is a hunting and this was a hunting and gathering society at that time. It, a very fundamental expression of, of, of human r religious uh, um <coughs> faith. And uh, they, they uh, were polytheists. They believed in their ancestors were alive. They, when they went into trance, they said that they uh, uh, had gone, afterwards they said they had gone to see their ancestors in, uh, in the, uh <coughs> the uh, ancestral village, as they call it. And um, I, I, I just want you to know that I fully respect this uh, this belief system, uh, although I, uh, as much as I, I do uh, uh, the others that I've mentioned, and, and um, uh, I think that, uh, that there's it's it's uh, it, it shows you how uh, looking at a system like this shows you how religion uh, fills uh, very basic human needs, and this is what uh, I saw last year when I went back to visit there. Uh, it's very similar uh, uh, trance dance, except that at this point uh, women were the only uh, trance dancers. So that, that's one of the. Uh, it's parallel to the change that Richard talked about yesterday in the in the role of women in in certain ways in in uh, our society. But of course, it's not like uh, <coughs> the elimination of of religion. Okay, so <coughs> before I took this. Uh, philosophy course, I thought <coughs> there were three answers to the question, do you believe in God? Uh, one, <coughs> I believe God exists. Uh, two, I believe God does not exist. Three, I don't know if God exists. But there aren't three, there are four. Uh, I don't understand you, <coughs> is the, the answer that my philosophy professor gave. And that is the first answer that, that I give. Um, if you say, if you then say, when I say don't, I don't understand you, if you then say, well, um, I mean a guy in the sky who spoke to Moses and, and dictated the Ten Commandments, then I know what to say. Then I say two. Uh, <coughs> that does not exist and did not exist. Uh, it, it, but if you say something like God is love or God is life or God is the spirit in all things, or you say something vague, uh, uh, vague uh, around that, uh, then I say I don't understand you. So you can think of me as Schrodinger's cat, sort of smeared between two and four, uh, and, uh, uh, and that's where I stand now. And one of the things I accepted after this course was uh, Russell's, what I call Russell's rule, which is better not to believe in things for which there is no evidence. As I believe that very firmly. But as you can see, that's an ought statement. It's an article, in, in that sense, it's an article of faith. Now, I could, I could tell you why I believe that, <coughs> why I think it's a better way to move through the world than a lot of others, but I can't prove it to you. It's, a, it's an odd statement. 
And uh, here's another one from Wittgenstein, <coughs> who famously said of that, which we cannot speak, it is best to remain silent. Uh, I haven't seen uh, uh, a lot of evidence uh, uh, of adherence to that in, uh, uh, in the world. But uh, I try, and I, I, I don't always live by it myself, but I try. So here's what Darwin said in The Descent of Man about religion. He, sa uh, he said that uh, it was something consisting, highly complicated, consisting of love, complete submission to an exalted and mysterious superior, a strong sense of dependence, fear, reverence, gratitude, hope for the future, and perhaps other elements. Very complicated thing. And it actually, the, the other elements category is probably bigger than, than <coughs> the, the rest of the paragraph. And Darwin wrote to uh, Asa Gray <coughs> in 1860, uh, I feel most strongly that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. A dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. Uh, and um, this was a letter, <coughs> uh, a letter to a, a, a reverend, and, and Darwin did have the habit of being polite to, to folks like that. It's also a letter uh, in which he, uh, he points out that, um, uh, the, the, that the habit of economics uh, in in eating caterpillars, live caterpillars from the inside out did not seem to, to be evidence of a beneficent creator. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he did uh, refuse to, um, to get involved in, in the uh, conversations about this. So one of the things <coughs> I did after Roger invited me to speak here was um, I bought a stack of books, <coughs> uh, uh, recent books about uh, religion, and uh, I uh, these these three books are, um, are are briefs in favor of of belief in God. They uh, uh, either repeat old arguments about why God exists uh, or describe um, personal experiences, like the one that I uh, didn't have this morning. Uh, and uh, and they're, com they're 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 nice books in a way, but they're completely unconvincing to me. Uh, Polkinghorne, by the way, has very, a very interesting uh, gambit, which is, seems new. Uh, he takes the god of the gaps idea, <coughs> which has come up, and, uh, and points out that, that now there are two un unfillable, unclosable gaps, uh, and <coughs> one being uh, quantum indeterminacy because of empirical impossibility, and, and the other being formal chaos because of uh, technical impossibility of closing the gaps. And he sees God in those unclosed gaps. And what I see there is uh, unclosed gaps and unclos unclosable gaps. I agree with that part. <coughs> so here are some books. Uh, uh, the, t the top two, as you know well, are, are on the other side. Uh, I, I think uh, these two uh, books are very similar to the ones in the last slide in that they are briefs for a particular point of view. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, and that's, that's fine. Uh, they are uh, impertinent and, and impolite, which is great. Uh, but actually, they're also intemperate. And that's not so good because it kind of makes you less logical. Um, f for example, let's say you had a hypothesis that uh, that religion has done much more harm than good in the world. How would you go about testing that? Well, you would, you would want to jeopardize it, or at least you would want to, to marshal the evidence of, of the harm and then marshal the evidence of the good. But these two books only marshal the evidence of the, of the harm. I'll give you an, an analogy, which is a bad analogy, but, but suppose I, I, I really... I uh, want, really want to make money on a book. I write a book uh, about water with a chapter on tsunamis, a chapter on hurricanes, a, a chapter on the fact that, that almost all the water in the world is salty and poisonous to humans, and then said water, water's a bad thing. Well, uh, that's the method. This is, not, this is not a good analogy, but that's the method that's taken uh, in these two books. Uh, Sam's book is also, <coughs> and you can, read, you can read the review by of Richard's book by Terry Eagleton, which I uh, will tell you more about why I think what I think about it. Uh, S -S Sam's book is in what I would call the, the chicken little uh, genre of, of uh, attacks on religion. We're going to, uh, uh, to face the worst uh, consequences in the history of the world. H how anybody, uh, uh, if we don't get rid of religion, how anybody could, could look at the 20th century, where, by the way, um, 
only a, only a fraction of the scores of millions of, of violent deaths are attributable to, to religion. Um, I, 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 th I don't know, but <coughs> uh, and, and say that the, that, that, that the worst is, uh, is going to come from religion, I, I think it shows a, a, a failure to take a balanced uh, view of, of what has happened in history uh, and, and a lack of interest, as, as, uh, as Jim pointed out, in, in evidence. <coughs> and in really, I, I'm now, I'm not saying that the conclusions that, that are drawn in these two books would not be confirmed by, by appropriate uh, scientific methods. I'm just saying that, uh, that they weren't taken and that, uh, <coughs> um, that for them to be uh, the, in the vanguard of the scientific approach to, to uh, t talking with religious people in the world, uh, it's about as, as, as far away from the right approach uh, uh, as you can get, in my opinion. Dan Dennett. <coughs> also has a lot of snide uh, uh, remarks to make about religion, but, but uh, he is actually interested in, in, in evidence. He, doesn't, he, he talks about the different categories of evidence for, for, the, uh, uh, for, for, for the way religion works and the, and the harm and good it does, um, <coughs> but he doesn't, um, uh, he doesn't uh, uh, refrain from bashing religion too, which, which is okay. But, but uh, by the way, if you haven't read his wonderful letter that's on, on the table outside. He wrote a, a letter uh, from what, what will, could easily have been his deathbed to all of us, basically, <coughs> uh, uh, about the experiences he had. And uh, there are no surprises, but it's a very <laughs> eloquent and, and, and good thing. I, ur I urge you to read it. Uh, and uh, Steve Gould's book, Rocks of Ages, uh, is something that um, I, I can't endorse either. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why a, a little later. Uh, so, after reading these uh, uh, these polemics, by the way, I have, I have after after saying negative things about Joan's uh, book, I have to say that it's gracefully written and that she is a paragon of courage for coming into this den of vipers and and uh, trying to <laughs> present a religious viewpoint. Uh, so I went to my own bookshelf and found these. Uh, and dusted them off and, uh, and read them. And I cannot tell you uh, what a relief it was to, to read calm, reasoned uh, argument about complex subjects that, that truly uh, address the issues in a balanced way. And by the way, come to the conclusion that you know, either, either two or four in my list of positions on God is, is, is right. Uh, <coughs> And I suggest that, that, that as, for, as for convincing people that, that, uh, that their religious convictions, the people who are on the borderline or the people who are susceptible to being convinced, uh, if you want to convince them um, what, why they uh, shouldn't believe, I, I would recommend these books <coughs> uh, first. So if this book works, this is a quotation from The God Delusion, as I intend religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. And, what and this is the next line, what presumptuous optimism, of course, died in the wool faith heads are immune to argument, of course, uh, Im immune. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why I, uh, uh, I succumbed to the arguments of my philosophy professor, I suppose, this died in the wool faith heads are immune to argument. But at any rate, um, and this is from the end of faith, the Sam's book, the days of our religious identities are clearly numbered. So delusion as defined by <laughs> DSRT, <laughs> a false belief based on incorrect inference about external reality that is firmly sustained despite what almost everybody else believes. So that, that is a certainly one part of delusion. And to be fair, Richard says this is not the definition of delusion that he wants to use. He wants to use the, the dictionary def the definition uh, uh, of delusion, um, which is a false belief or impression, and uh, you know, by that definition, we've all had at least six delusions before breakfast today. <laughs> uh, but it, it does, and, and Sam and, and Richard's books don't meet the next criterion um, because there is no incontrovertible and obvious proof or evidence to the to uh, to support the existence of God. But uh, you notice that that psychiatrists have explicitly said. Uh, that uh, articles of religious faith don't count. Now, 
look, look at these two statements and uh, ask yourself, you know, which is which more closely fulfills the, the, the definition, the technical definition of delusion. Uh, and it's clearly these statements and not uh, the statement, I believe in God. I'm not going to go into detail about this. This is the standard <coughs> uh, uh, arguments against belief. <coughs> they are numerous. They are convincing. Every one, one of them is, is, is endorsed by me uh, as I stand here. Um, and, uh, and I think there are a lot of interesting, um, uh, there's a lot of interesting things say to, to, to say about each of them. Uh, then you have uh, the, the explanations for religion that are, that are psychological and psychosocial, and I also thoroughly endorse those. And you have, uh, uh, and so the, the belief in God uh, it, it, it draws on certain psychological uh, needs and yearnings, of, and, and other aspects of religion draw on other aspects uh, and furthermore, <coughs> I agree uh, with Richard and, uh, and Sam that all sacred texts are characterized by errors and lies, internal and mutual contradictions, uh, uh, implausible supernatural origins, and silly or cruel behavior of gods and religious heroes. Now, I show you these, this list because I want to tell you <coughs> that if, if, um, if you're having trouble remembering the, the conversations that you had late at night in your college dormitory then you sh you about these things. And you should, uh, by all means, go out and do what I did and spend a couple of hundred bucks on, uh, on a stack of books attacking religion, because it will refresh your, your memory of those conversations very well. But uh, y you won't find out anything new. <coughs> so taking these objections, we need to recognize that none of them is new. Uh, all have, have been heard or independently thought of by most intelligent people. And most important, none has posed or is likely to pose a serious obstacle to belief in the minds of the vast majority of believers. How can that be? Well, once upon a time, there were major religious leaders who thought they could explain how the physical world works. They also cared a lot about proofs of God's existence. But thanks to Galileo and all, these people have been in retreat for four centuries. But most religious people don't care about proofs. It's not news to them that religion has caused great harm it's, or that sacred texts are flawed or that science explains most things. They have been meeting those objections with aplomb for centuries. Most don't care. <coughs> they will proudly tell you about argument. They don't care about evidence. They don't even care that they can't clearly define God. Most think that all these conversations are silly. So what do they care about? Faith. Defined in letter to the Hebrews as the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. And Sam, uh, Sam's definition is, uh, or, or sta his, his, uh, ba one of his basic statements is, religious faith forms a kind of perverse cultural singularity, a vanishing point beyond which rational discourse proves impossible. Yes, that's what it is, Sam. Get over it. <laughs> If you don't understand it, try this. When you present arguments against religion to a person of faith, you might as well tell her to care as much about other people's children as about her own, or urge her to stop her ears, give up music, and learn sign language, or harangue an enophile about the dangers of alcohol and try to enlist his support for a return to prohibition. By the way, my, my water analogy is not fair, but uh, a, a, an ethanol analogy is, I think, uh, uh, it's on, it's on the other side. Religion is somewhere between water and ethanol, in my view. Uh, ethanol uh, causes, uh, uh, demonstrably causes great harm. Uh, we also know now that, that, uh, <coughs> that it causes uh, some good, uh, and uh, that the balance is clearly in favor of, uh, uh, of harm w with ethanol. Well, why was prohibition repealed? It, it was not repealed because people had the, bad, uh, the wrong idea about that balance. It was repealed because it was discovered that the attempt to abolish ethanol and the use of ethanol for consciousness alteration was more costly than the harm done by alcohol. That's the conclusion that was come to. And I, I urge on you the analogy of that with religion, um, because not only do Sam and Richard's books not take up the balance between the good done by religion and the harm done by religion, they do not even uh, uh, consider the harm that could be done by attempting to abolish religion, which they both advocate strongly. <coughs> so, 
So none of these efforts, which I just mentioned, is in principle impossible. And I say what Jim said, good luck. <laughs> uh, a quotation from another of Richard's books on weaving the rainbow. I remember once trying gently to amuse a six-year-old child at Christmas time by reckoning up with her how long it would take Father Christmas to go down all the chimneys in the world. The obvious possibility that her parents had been telling falsehoods never seemed to cross her mind. Huh. Well, the uh, spectacle of a grown man using statistics to trying to drive a wedge between a six-year-old and Santa Claus would be comical, except what Richard uh, has said in his book and what he said yesterday, and, and Dan Dennett also uh, um, says, uh, says something approving about it, is that uh, raising someone, uh, raising a child in a religious face is a form of child abuse. Uh, we have no business calling um, a four-year-old a Catholic. Of course, Richard has just abused the word, the way we use the word. Uh, he has uh, neglected to mention that when we call a four-year-old Catholic, what we mean is, is a four-year-old being raised in a Catholic family and not a, a four-year-old who understands the catechism and subscribes to Catholic dogma. Uh, and, and there's a lot of this kind of abusive language uh, that has gone on in this meeting. But <coughs> um, Richard and, and, uh, and Dan Dennett, say approving things about uh, a viewpoint of, of Nick, uh, Nicholas Humphrey, I think it is, in uh, what will we teach, what, what uh, shall we tell the children. Uh, and they, uh, and you heard Richard yesterday, propose very strongly that, that uh, we try to prevent people from uh, bringing up their children in a faith. And uh, this is really scary. And I'll tell you why it's, it's so scary. Uh, uh, I, with apologies to, uh, to Oliver Cromwell, uh, I beseech you in the shadow of Darwin, think whose children will be taken away first. In a world where it's okay to tell other people how to indoctrinate or not indoctrinate their children, your children and mine will be taken away first. Recent studies <coughs> suggest that Religiosity is substantially heritable. It shows variation in, in the, uh, the human species, and it's substantially heritable. Its heritability increases from adolescence to adulthood. That's a little bit less secure of a finding, but it's, uh, it, it suggests that re religiosity is canalized and that after you get rid of the, uh, the hormonal and environmental noise of adolescence, you, uh, you kind of revert to type. <coughs> and uh, there is uh, some evidence uh, that it reduces the risk of psychiatric illness, or at least it's associated with lower levels of psychiatric illness, which is not terribly surprising to those of us who understand religion. A lot of statistics have been thrown about <coughs> concerning uh, the, uh, the, the lack of religiosity in Europe. And th this is a chart from 2005 Eurobarometer survey. Uh, and the yellow portion, the yellow portion it, it, it represents the people who, when you, when you ask them which of these statements come closest to your beliefs, those people said, I don't, <coughs> uh, I don't even believe, it. I don't believe in any sort of God or spirit. I'm sorry, I can't read that exactly, but that's very close to it. Uh, so the people in light blue believe in some kind of spirit, uh, uh, and the people in dark blue believe in conventional ideas of God. I think that... <coughs> Uh, that somewhere, uh, uh, I, would, I would hypothesize that somewhere around here uh, you have kind of the asymptote of, of, uh, of, of human uh, 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 sort of responses after you've convinced them uh, as much as you can <coughs> that their ideas are silly. Uh, I, 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 uh, that's a hypothesis, and, uh, and unlike uh, uh, some other people, I would say we have to to, to study it, like Dan says, like Dan Dennett says. We have to study to find out if I'm right, that this is the asymptote. Uh, but uh, uh, such studies will not be done if we make up our minds in advance. And remember that 15% of National Academy members uh, <coughs> are believers. So if the asymptote isn't at 20 or 30%, uh, it's surely not much less than this. It's not going away. That, now, that doesn't mean it can't be reduced. <coughs> I, think, I think it can. I would like to see the United States become more like, like France uh, or, or um, uh, other countries in Western Europe. But uh, it, it's not going away. And 
so what would I like to see happen? Well, <coughs> first, Russell's rule should be adopted as widely as possible. Uh, don't believe in things. Try to get, convince people not to believe in things for which there's no evidence. Second, uh, with Dan Dennett, I think that scientists should study religion and publish and teach their observations. That is, what they find out. Third, scientists should spread the good news, which is what gospel means, <laughs> uh, about the beauty, power, value, and values of science. And I want to say that, that uh, I, I, I would associate myself with uh, the, the, the beauty and power of, uh, of Carolyn Porco's uh, presentation and, uh, and urge us all to, to do more things along those lines in communicating with the public. Um, and finally, scientists should reduce, resist the delusion that religion can be eliminated. Now getting back to uh, Steve Gould's <coughs> book, Rocks of Ages, he proposes that uh, something he calls NOMA, which is that religion and science are non-overlapping magisteria, uh, <coughs> a, uh, uh, and that they should just leave each other alone, uh, and, and, uh, and that they're really both wonderful things. <coughs> I, I, this sent me to the dictionary, and the Catholic Encyclopedic Dictionary defines the church's uh, magisterium as the church's divinely appointed authority to teach the truth of religion. So I'm proposing a NOMA 2, uh, neither one is magisterial. And, uh, uh, you know, science <laughs> is, is, uh, is really wonderful, but uh, the Galileo character in Breck's play about him says, the aim of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set some limit on infinite error. And uh, in, in my view, <coughs> that's, that's a, a, a great definition of science. And to, to make it more explicit, it's the quite successful effort of some very clever members of the third chimpanzee, that's us, to understand and move through the world a little less bumblingly than their forebears did. Uh, whereas religion is the partly successful effort of some strangely thoughtful members, I would say strangely, uh, again, of the same sorry species to ease the fears and yearnings that remain after science has done all that it can do. This is a quotation from what I think might be the greatest poem in the English language, uh, <coughs> Sunday Morning by Wallace Stevens, and I, I commend it to, uh, to people like Carolyn Porco and uh, uh, others who, who want to start, uh, and, and, and Neil Tice, and others who want to start a, uh, a science-based um, uh, uh, movement that's something like religion. What is divinity if it can come only in silent shadows and in dreams? Shall she not find in comforts of the sun, in pungent fruit and bright green wings, or else in any balm or beauty of the earth, things to be cherished like the thought of heaven? This is a great text for those of you who are, uh, who are interested in a, <coughs> a religion based on the beauty of uh, nature and the cosmos. <coughs> so, uh, there's a fifth answer that I want to share with you. Uh, uh, about the, uh, to the question, do you believe in God? Uh, Golda Meir, who, who uh, was Prime Minister of Israel and, and a, a socialist and an atheist, uh, was asked whether she believed in God. And she said, I believe in the Jewish people, and the Jewish people believe in God. So I'm going to, uh, to modify that and tell you, I believe in the human species, and the human species believes in God. That's uh, uh, th not the last word on the subject, but it's a pretty good hypothesis. And I'll close with uh, another line from Darwin's letter to Asa Gray, uh, which I, th I think expresses what he really thought, and not just being polite. Uh, and I think it is what, uh, closer to what uh, w will serve us well uh, as we move through the world and communicating science to uh, religious people, let each man or woman hope and believe what he or she can. Thank you. So, um, questions? Joan, you just spoke, didn't you? Okay. Are you awaiting to speak? That was it. Yeah, that's what I was waiting to speak. Um, Joan Roughgarden, uh, two things. Uh, thanks, Mel, for a talk with some humor, <laughs> which is uh, the uh, first thing I want to say is I, I that with Harry Proto, is, is that um, worth living 
the first thing I'd like to say is that evolution in Christian faith, unlike Francis Collins' book, is in no way an attempt to convert anyone. No way. But it is not an attempt to convert anyone or to proselytize in any way, shape, or form. Right. Okay. It is specifically, and it says so up front, directed to an audience that for whatever reason already considers uh, itself a community of faith. So it's specifically directed to people who already associate with a Christian tradition in particular, and it's about what evolution is and uh, an attempt to explain evolution in terms that are friendly to people who already, for whatever reason, identify with that tradition. And it yeah. is definitely I not. Think, I think that's, that's fair, but, but yeah. it also takes the position that, that um, science and, and relig religion, science and faith are reconcilable. Oh, right. y yes, takes that position, but that's not an attempt to sell anyone on the desirability. If we could actually deal with the larger points as well, rather than specific yeah. uh, now the, uh, the individual book. May I continue? Sure. Yeah. Um, the other point uh, is to Sam, and, and uh, all I would like to say, I mean, because it's getting quite tedious, frankly, mm -hmm. as we're going round and around on this, is that um, you've got to deliver the goods on um, producing uh, a moral system which could be entertained as an alternative to the moral systems that might uh, improve from religious traditions. That is to say, someone who is an arbitrary citizen, let's say, has a choice of whether or not um, to commit moral um, effort into um, uh, rectifying uh, the problems that exist in the current moral in the current religious traditions, or in starting a new one from scratch. And if you want to start a new one from scratch, which, as you know, I am very skeptical of, you got to do it. And I think that it's gratuitous to conduct um, uh, a continuing and scathing condemnation of religion, regardless of whether it was correct. It's just simply gratuitous, because I think that it's necessary actually to produce the program that you would recommend um, we contemplate mm. as an alternative. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think that's easily done. It's not a matter of inventing a religion or any other system from scratch. It's a matter of adopting the same standards of reasonableness we rather effortlessly adopt and insist upon in every other area of our lives on questions of morality and spiritual experience. If, if I go into a cave and pray to Jesus and I have, I come out the most loving person anyone has met and I, I can tell you about the phenomenology of this experience. I pray to Jesus and I realize that I, I love my neighbor as myself and, and um, this is incredibly rewarding and now I'm just the nicest guy to be around you've ever met. Okay, this is evidence for something. It's evidence for the plasticity of human experience. It's evidence for the consequences of using attention in certain ways. We can talk about this. We can explore this landscape without making the unjustified and intrinsically divisive metaphysical leap to this proves that Jesus was born of a virgin and there's no, no other name under which anyone is saved, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not denying that that there is a, a wealth of experience that is traditionally only had within a religious context that we will want to explore. If, if ritual is important to us, if ritual is doing some really necessary work for us, we should understand that. And I, I suspect it might be doing necessary work for us. Uh, but, and if I can just segue for, from that to, to a brief response to the other two presentations, uh, I'm very grateful to your presentations. I think it's, um, I mean, the, the distance between us is precisely why I think a conference like this is important. Um, and your presentations, as I think will not surprise you, really typify for me what I think the problem is in our discourse. I mean, the, the kinds of, and this, if, if I can defend my own work and, and Richard's as well, uh, what is new about what I think we are doing, the kind of criticism we're launching, uh, which you don't find in, in Voltaire or any other predecessors who have been stridently opposed to religious dogmatism, is that 
we are talking quite candidly about how the kinds of apologetics you just invoked uh, stand on a continuum with religious extremism, that, that, it, that it provides immense shelter for the, for the status quo in our world, and it provides a tacit endorsement of the religious divisions in our world. And I'll give you an example of why I think that's so. Uh, I find it very instructive, Jim, and, and uh, telling that you will take uh, Martin Luther King's word for why he's doing what he's doing. You know, he's, he's marching for civil rights because of his Christian faith. But you will not take Osama bin Laden's word for why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, I would never be tempted to deny that, that nobody ever does good on the basis of what their religious belief, uh, what they believe about God. Uh, I have not denied that. Uh, in fact, I, I'm willing to admit that there are certain circumstances in which people will do heroically self-sacrificing and compassionate things and maybe only do them to that degree on the basis of irrational dogmas. Uh, but uh, that is an exception, and I think uh, it's time we talked uh, quite candidly about the kinds of, of horrendous things that are, that are only possible uh, in a world where in incredibly destructive technology is proliferating by the day. Uh, the kinds of, of, of uh, terrible things that are only possible by, uh, by virtue of religious dogmatism. Uh, a few more piecemeal responses. This idea that you can't take away people's hope. I, you know, you could stand at the Nuremberg rally and admonish me in the same vein. Sam, you can't take away people's hope. I mean, these are, no one would be t tempted to defend Nazism as something that is, is giving people such meaning that it's, you know, we have, to, we have to study the Nazis to see if they really hate the Jews. Are they really being motivated by their hatred of the Jews? Are they really being motivated by their racial dogmatism? Um, uh, it seems to me uh, the height of, of uh, I mean, a, really a terrifying degree of, sci of intellectual paralysis if we are not going to concede that specific consciously held beliefs uh, are operative in, in human behavior. And you mentioned Stalinism and, and Nazism. I mean, the fact that you could bring out that canard as a sign of one of the, as a counterpoint to the criticism of religious dogmatism, as though this were a sign of uh, reason run amok, you know, the, the reason gave us Auschwitz and, and uh, the gulag and the killing fields. Well, wait, uh, that, that, that's, that is a fantasy. Can I just inter intervene? Okay, I but, never said anything remotely like that. Okay, uh, yeah. but uh, just to finish it, the problem that we're criticizing here is dogmatism. And I, no one's saying that the only form of dogmatism is, re is religious, but what you have invoked is a defense of one brand of dogmatism, religious dogmatism. Don't take away people's hope on this front. Uh, we, have, we, we need more information to know if dogmas are ever operative. And I would be the first to criticize the, not the dogmas of the Nazis or the dogmas of Stalin. Uh, the problem is divisive dogmatism that is empowering to, to uh, a mob mentality. And, and, there's, and there's one kind of dogmatism we are loath to criticize. And it is the dogmatism that goes under the name of faith. Do you want to respond? Well, I, uh, well, I'll respond to the parts that are relevant to me. First, uh, you won't be surprised, Sam, to, uh, since you think that I'm part of the problem and you're the solution, that I think you're part of the problem. Uh, in fact, I think you, you and Richard are, are remarkably uh, apt mirror images of, uh, of, of the extremists on the other side and that you polarize each other, and that you, uh, that you and they po polarize each other, and that you generate more fear and hatred of, uh, of science uh, by doing so. <clears throat> As for uh, not taking away the patient's hope, I, I'm really tired of the invocation of this, this thoroughly specious analogy uh, to, uh, to Nazism. It's, uh, you know, it's just the, uh, uh, it's an abusive use of, uh, of, of the example. Uh, there is nothing in common with uh, the vast majority of, of people of faith's feeling and thought uh, and uh, the, that of the people in the Nuremberg rally. Of course, there are rallies in Tehran today that are uh, actually quite like the Nuremberg rally, and I'm worried about them too. But. You haven't, you haven't taken up the, the, the more serious challenge. For example, 
uh, how is it that religion uh, played a relatively small role in the calamitous 20th century uh, in which scores of millions of deaths occurred because of uh, um, nationalism, um, because of, of uh, communism, because of fascism. Uh, you, you just want to wave your hand and say, oh, well, that's religion too. Well, I mean, you yourself said the other day, this, the core of science is not quantification, it's intellectual honesty. I do not consider that an example of intellectual honesty, to just wave your hand and say, well, uh, that's religion too. It isn't religion. It's something different. And we, we, uh, we already know that it's a bad thing because of, 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 uh, uh, of clear proof that it did uh, that, that it did much more harm than good, uh, and, and you are to unwilling to take to take a, a, an, a an empirical approach to the question of whether religion does or does not do more harm than good. It's, it's just not true. Um, to take that specific challenge, uh, that religion had not much to do with the, the great uh, travesties of the 20th century. Uh, you take the Holocaust. Now that is genu generally argued as an example of a secular problem. Anti-Semitism in, in, in Germany at that moment was a, a sec an expression of a secular hatred. Now, where do you get anti-Semitism? I mean, how is it even possible to have uh, the racial anti-Semitism that we had in, in the 21st century that is ubiquitous around the world that has justified the, the, uh, the existence of the state of Israel? So anti-Semitism has been manufactured stem to stern out of religion, out of what, out of a thousand years of Christian fulminating against the Jews. So you're, okay, you're, well, we, we can cite, it's not a historical. I, I do, well, I, well, okay. Anti-Semitism precedes Christianity by a long time, Anti by centuries. Well, but, okay, Based well, on race and the, the, the religious designation well, becomes important with the rise of the Catholic Church, it's true. Centuries of, of, of anti-Semitism pursued by Christians did feed into the, the, the hysterical, uh, uh, animosity toward the Jews in well, 20th let's century not, Europe. Let's not tangle. That, because, well, that's I not think, the same thing as saying that, well, it's, you know, it's really Let me just ask you one question then, okay? Let's say we, we're going to uh, resolve the dispute in the Middle East this way. We're going to offer the Jews, the Israelis, um, Oregon. You know, we get it into our heads. This is, this is going to just, just solve the conflict. Why won't they accept Oregon? As, or get, 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 as prime a piece of real estate as you want to give them in the heart of the United States. Move over here, you'll, you, the, the, no more uh, suicide bombing, uh, give, give the Holy Land to the Muslims. One, do you think they would accept that? And two, and two why not? Well, uh, in the early history of Zionism, they were uh, given a number of such offers and they rejected them. Uh, they rejected rejected them in part for uh, for the uh, reasons that you would certainly invoke uh, of, of irrational religious belief about um, their right to to that piece of land uh, that would be uh, uh, certainly part of it and another part of it would be uh, objective uh, historical attachment to that piece of land uh, and uh, and the the huge divide in Israel today between the the religious and the and the secular, who uh, some of who, my friends there are are even angrier about religion than than Richard and Sam, um, is, is sort of along these lines. There are people who who are committed to the place because of of religious faith, and people who are committed to it because of. Uh, historical attachment. Jim, you... Yeah, can I just... Uh, Richard, just... since you're being invoked, do you want to join this? I think it's reasonable. Um, Jim, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, if I could just quickly uh, respond to a couple of things you said, Sam. Um, first of all, I, in, in saying that, for example, the, the civil rights movement, the United States had a religious inspiration, I was not at all suggesting that we could establish that simply by taking the word of the people who were uh, involved in it for what their motivations are. And, you know, there, there are detailed historical studies of the origins of the civil rights movement that support this analysis. And that's just the sort of thing that I'm recommending. And I find it- And the ability uh, to persuade whites. Yeah, yeah. 
and I find it just absolutely remarkable that merely pointing out what I take to be the empirical fact that um, sometimes uh, uh, religiously motivated people have done good things makes me an apologist for uh, religious extremism, as though, or, or, or merely saying that, that we need a better empirical understanding of why people are drawn to uh, religious doctrines and um, you know, sort of what the psychological mechanisms are, et cetera, um, makes me um, uh, a fan of, uh, of uh, an apologist for uh, bin Laden. I mean, well, I, I really find that extremely offensive. Okay, well, in 20 seconds, let me tell you why I, I, uh, I have described the problem that way. Because we have evidence, abundant evidence, uh, of all the variables that you cited, like you, 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 you advocated that we understand this politically and economically and, and uh, invoking these other variables, which to you as a scientist seem far more likely to be underwriting people's behavior. We have, uh, in case after case, situations where those variables have been stripped away. I mean, we have the 19 hijackers, for instance, on September 11th. Who were these 19 guys? These were guys who were middle class or better. They were all college educated. Many of them had PhDs. They were architects and engineers. Um, the, you know, Ayman al-Zawahiri is, a, is a, a, uh, a physician whose 50 known family members are the, the cream of the crop of Egyptian society, judges and, 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 and physicians and pharmacists, as far as the eye can see. The, the variables that you are invoking rather reflexively uh, as an explanation for this kind of behavior are not operative, and these people are telling us over and over again, uh, just ad nauseum, why they were doing what they were doing, what they believe, and g if you just look at what they say they believe, you'll see that their behavior is quite rational within the contents of, the, of that belief system. And so we are, I mean, the desperation you hear from me and the frustration is that we are wasting time. I mean, this, this conference is purposed toward convincing someone like you that we even have a problem with religion. Uh, and that, I find that just an, a, a phantasmagorically strange situation to be in. Um, and that's, you know, you know, I'm sorry to be so strident, but, but it, uh, I think this really matters. You know, I mean, wh which one of us wins this argument? I think really, I think the consequences of that really matters. Jim, do you want to re respond to that? Uh, no, no, why don't we go on? I, uh, well, well, uh, let, let me get you a mic. Beatrice Galam, I'm in the Department of Medicine at UC San Diego, and recognizing that all analogies are false analogies, I'd like to follow up on the alcohol analogy. The statement was made that alcohol has good properties and bad properties, and on balance, the bad properties went out. In fact, I think what we think now is that alcohol has good properties with certain patterns of use and is bad with other patterns of use and in other people. And we're currently directing our efforts to extinguishing or at least mitigating the bad uses that have inimical outcomes. One thing we've discovered is that these bad uses are increased by certain reward systems. In this case, um, inherited alterations in the dopamine system that lead to increases in reward for excessive alcohol consumption in certain people. And one thing that we direct our efforts to doing is counterbalancing those rewards by things like antabuse that make the punishments exceed the rewards for those bad uses in those individuals who use them badly. I would make the claim that beyond religious factors, which I absolutely believe are a major part of the problem, as Sam Harris points out, there probably are also social factors that add to the rewards of those bad behaviors. And I would claim that one of those social factors is that we in the West have repeatedly incentivized terrorism. We've incentivized it by interceding on the side of the terrorists in Palestine, in Kosovo, as it was pointed out when they did the cartoons and demanded that we not say bad things about Muhammad, a lot of people caved. And any behaviorist will tell you that when you reward a behavior that is in the rational interest of a group based on its beliefs, people will increase those behaviors. Perhaps one approach is to seek to find ways to de-incentivize rather than reward those behaviors by when those behaviors engage in taking things back, doing the opposite of what it is that that group seeks to gain by engaging in those behaviors. I think Mel, you made the no, I, I, you want to talk about. I, I certainly 
have no problem associating myself with what you just said. Uh, I, I don't want to repeat it. I, I think that uh, the reason that you were able to say it is that an empirical approach was taken to the, the harm done by alcohol, the good done by alcohol, the, the behavioral and, and uh, neurobiological mediators of, of both, and, uh, and re result uh, um, a treatment plan uh, for the alcohol problem, if you want to call it that. But, you know, I, I really don't want to just let this be a, uh, a discussion about good effects of alcohol versus bad effects of alcohol. I want to keep in mind, most importantly, because this is, this is the most relevant part of the analogy to what Richard and, uh, and Sam are proposing. Keep in mind the cost of prohibiting alcohol, the cost of trying to eliminate the alcohol use. Richard and and who's advocating and Sam the are very much like, of like the the temperance movement. Uh, they no, want no, to no, get no. rid Absolute, of something that's bad. That's absolutely you know? so, so can, we, can we can we do two, there's two points that I'm actually interested in that, that, that you both mentioned. One is the one that you're just about to go to, which is are you advocating the abolition of religion? Let me finish. And the second one is to I suppose this. This team over here, which seems to have shaped up, which is um, <laughs> when Sam mentioned uh, Nuremberg and, and you know the, the huge rallies and so on. I mean, duh! Doesn't that look like some kind of a signal? Why were people are slow to react? And is are we in the same situation now? Are we? I mean, what kind of a signal do we need to be convinced that this is uh, as historic and pressing a moment as Sam would and, and Richard would argue? Uh, the the uh, the moment is pressing. Uh, I you know I have to say I grew up in the in the 50s um, when the Soviet Union and the United States had pointed at each other uh, on a hair trigger uh, uh, the power to to pretty much destroy uh, human life on Earth if we believe Carl Sagan's analysis at least and. Uh, and I'm worried right now, but I'm not as worried as I was when I was 10. We used to have a joke when I was 10 uh, uh, in Brooklyn. Um, when you hear the air raid siren, um, crawl under the desk, crouch down, put your head between your legs, and kiss your ass goodbye. And that was what even the 10-year-olds in my neighborhood knew would, ha would w the, 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 you know, the response to the air raid would, would, ha would end up being. The 20, the, the, let, let, let me say that, that um, uh, the, the specious analysis of, the, of Stalinism and, and, uh, and Nazism that we've heard um, uh, uh, does not go to the heart of, of, of the issue uh, as a scientific question, and I'm a social behavioral scientist. The scientific question is what makes these terrible things happen? And their answer is religion. And we have repeatedly cited Pol Pot uh, to the anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism, sure. What about anti-Tutuism? Uh, what about the Tutsiism? What about the, the, the destruction of 800,000 lives in a month or two in, uh, in um, Rwanda? What about uh, uh, the, uh, the killing of communists in Indonesia uh, uh, on a mass scale. These are not motivated by religion. They are expressions of, of, of enduring flaws in human nature which need to be addressed by science. And sometimes religion encourages them. I fully accept that. Sometimes they're even expressions of religious indoctrination. I fully accept that. But this is a a, a much broader phenomenon, and a scientific approach requires that you look at the at the available cases, and and gather the information you have, and you will find that you cannot use uh, a religion as an explanation for many of those cases. But you can, can use it for some of them. <clears throat> I at least, and I'm sure Sam as well, have never suggested that religion is the only source of evil. If I go back to what Dr. Woodward was saying, saying that we haven't done the, the empirical correlation of the variation in um, 
horrible things that happen correlated with religion. Well, of course there are other variables. What on earth do you expect? There are lots of other, other variables, and nobody's denying that. The thing about the Quran is that it's one of the variables. The thing about religion is that it's one of the, of the variables. That's all that anyone is claiming. In the particular case of looking at uh, variation in terrorism in the world and not correlating it with changes. I mean, the Quran's been a, f a constant factor, as you've said. Well, so what? It is a constant factor, but that doesn't mean it's not an important factor. If you were to remove it, don't you think that that violence would go away if you could magic away religion? Now, the next question is... I don't know. That's an empirical it's, claim. It's, it's not an empirical claim. That's true. Now, the, ne the next point is the, is the nihilism, the negativity. Give up. Don't even try. Good luck to you. Religion's here to stay. You might as well just pack it in and die. Why do we have this negativity being, being, being thrown at us all the time? Maybe it is very difficult to get rid of religion, but is that a reason for not even trying? Is that a reason for wallowing in this sort of sentimental statements like, I believe in the human race and the human race believes in, 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 in God? Can't we grow out of that? Yeah, well, one other piece I would just like to add is that I keep saying, I don't know how many times I have to say this, the problem is dogma. The problem is not merely religion, it's dogma. And Stalinism, Pol Pot, all of these divisive political mythologies that, that, that mobilized people in, in, the, in the horrendous ways that uh, you described, uh, these were dogmatic systems of belief. They were rigid ideologies. Stalinist, uh, Stalinism, you know, Stalin sent... Uh, biologists by the thousands to the gulag for not propping up Lysenko's biology. I mean, these were not kingdoms of reasonableness. Uh, and, and so the problem is dogma, and my, my only criticism of religion, really, is that it's the one area of discourse where dogma is allowed to thrive, systematically around, allowed to thrive, cannot be called dogma, cannot be uh, uh, jettisoned the way we jettison other political dogmas. Anti-Semitism is a bad thing, but believing that uh, only uh, Catholics get, get into heaven, it can't be said to be a bad thing. And that's, that's a problem for discourse. Uh, so, you know, I could have written a book called The End of Dogma. It would have had the same contents with perhaps a chapter on Stalinism. Uh, I, I, I fail to see how your then you would then you would have done the analysis in a much better way. No, well, no but not that's not really I mean, because done. because the moment because my book was a response to 9/11 and it's a, it's it's a response to this particular moment where you, we can't even have this conversation I think rationally about the role that religion is playing in the world. Well, there, there are a lot of responses to 9/11, not not all helpful. Well, that's not that's not an argument. Well, okay, let's go back to the argument. Where if you had written a book on the end of dogma, you would, and, and you had not had a tendentious, preconceived notion of what you wanted to, to, to conclude, then you, you might have discovered something about, uh, about what the, the process of what happened in Cambodia, uh, or, or Maoist China, or Stalin's Russia, ha, a, a, or, or for that matter, in, in Hitler's Europe, uh, had in common or didn't have in common with uh, with religiously motivated uh, 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 killings and massacres. I don't know what that that would have been exactly. There happened to be a lot of social scientists working and historians working on that question, but they're working on an empirical way. Uh, you would also have had to deal with with exceptions to the assertion you just made without evidence that it's always dogma. What is the dogma that caused uh, the the Hutu to slaughter eight hundred thousand? Uh, Tutsi, what's the dogma? What's the well, belief they, system? They Give have, me the list uh, of, of again. Of, I'm I'm not saying there, there wasn't any. There well, was no, there just was. hatred. No, there, well, no, there was a, there was a lot of dogmatism in that, and I, I invite you to read a uh, the book tell, Mach tell Machete me, Season. Tell me, tell me what the dogma was, because I obviously don't understand well, your there, definition okay, of there, dogma. There are other kinds of, of that, the, uh, that the Tutsi are bad. Okay, that, that they're okay. The problem we have, globally speaking, is. Uh, us them modes of thinking that really that's, that that demonize outgroup. I mean, we have tribalism as a now problem. You're, now no, you're no, getting no, it's, close. It's, now you're getting close to a serious understanding okay, uh, well, of this problem. Well, there's more than one cause of any effect. I mean, it's it, it, you're, Mel. You're talking as, as though one were to say, 
prove to me that all disease is due to viruses. It's not. Some disease is due to bacteria. We have religion, we have dogma, we have um, tribalism, we have all sorts of problems. Don't let's say that just because religion isn't always the problem, therefore it's not a problem. But you wouldn't like to get rid of all the bacteria in the human body. So what? I mean, that, um, so that, that, that's because we understand that we can't live without bacteria. And we can't, we, we, and, and that bacteria I understand do that things we, for us. We and, cannot live right? without bacteria. We can perfectly well live without religion. You, you yeah. can. You described the experiment that proved that you can. You didn't respond to, to uh, the transcranial magnetic stimulation the way 80% of people do. There's variation in this. Well, okay. There's I mean, a genetically you're a pessimist inherited and I'm an optimist, but let's at least try. And you don't, you don't respond. So, so that's great. And, and I, what, by the way, what I think is very valuable that you guys could do is get out there and find more people like yourselves or people in the, in the middle ground who, uh, uh, who actually need help uh, in, in, uh, in discovering that they don't have faith uh, because they've been uh, bamboozled by, by uh, their upbringing or by the, the culture. And I think that's, I, th I, I suspect that you're already doing that. And I think that's, that's exactly a very good, good thing yeah. to do. But that's not the way uh, um, I, 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 uh, I read your books. Uh, your books are, are uh, not like Bertrand Russell's books, which, or, which are attempts to offer an alternative in a rational, calm way to, uh, to people who are starting to, to get glimmers of understanding of the, of the irrationality of faith. That's what you get from Russell. Uh, what, that's not what I get from you. Uh, do, could, quick, quick reply from both of you. Do, do, do you have any sense at all after having been here, done the tours, the book tours and so on, that a different strategy work, would have worked better, a, a kind of gentler strategy, perhaps? Or well, I, I think it's very likely true that for um, actually converting religious people, I, ad I adopted completely the wrong strategy. For um, encouraging people who might have been on the fence, encouraging people who, as I believe there are enormous numbers of people who actually are non-religious but don't dare say so, I believe that we are um, showing the possibility of saying something where we're demonstrating that you can actually call a spade a spade and not get um, pilloried and persecuted for, for doing so. Well, I, I just want to make a kind of intermediate <coughs> comment here because the assertion is made that the problem is is dogma. Well, if the problem is dogma and you want to kind of rectify this, you better get it's straight what the dogma is, understand what the doctrine is first before you even come to the table to speak of it in a sense. So let me back up a minute and, mm. and say, um, well, when I was watching Mel's pictures and the Ten Commandments came up, it reminded me of a, of a comment, I think it was by Johnny Carson during the Tammy Faye, Jimmy, Jim Baker thing, you remember? He had mm -hmm. an adulterous relationship with his secretary. And the joke was, well, he's, Jim Baker's standing there looking up to heaven. He says, well, gosh, God, nine out of 10 isn't bad. <laughs> so, the, but we read, immediately know why we don't respond well to that. And that's because nothing less than the fullness of morality is right to us. Uh, we all have some sense of what Professor Dawkins called the noble passions of the deep goodness, where whatever its source may be. And we know that nothing less than the completeness of morality is going to answer the thing finally. And we know that we have a general term for that concept, and that's called love. So uh, I, I was talking with uh, Father Benedict Groeschel, who's the director of spiritual development for the Archdiocese in New York a f few weeks ago. And he was talking about the same kind of problems we, we are here. And he was saying to me, well, there's good religion and there's bad religion. He said, bad religion increases fear and good religion increases love. And it strikes me that a lot of what is being talked about in this conference is a criticism of bad religion. And I, I I've studied theology myself. After medical school, I studied theology for 10 years, partly because I was interested in, in pursuing the, the, the line of professional work I do, which is bioethics, and I want to understand what religion had to do with it, since it's so foundational. 
Um, and, and I did it also because I, I, my first child was born with brain damage and I couldn't exercise my, my profession because of the problems within my household. But in the process, I learned to overcome a great many of the prejudices that I'm hearing spoken here. And I, I'm, look, I'm scientifically trained, and I agree with many of the negative things that have been said about religion here. Um, I, I think what's going on, though, is a terrible misrepresentation of, the, of both the realm of religion and, and what the real issue is. And I want to just, just, I want to say one thing and then cite an example. I think the reason, one of the reasons we are seeing the rise of fundamentalism in America, which I decry, is because of, of a profound neglect of the deep roots of religion, of the deep issues of religion, of theology and philosophy that go into giving a strong foundation to religion. But I think the same thing is happening in this conversation, that, that uh, many of us here are just fundamentally ignorant of what the, the true doctrines are, the dogmas are. Now, then let me give you uh, one example. You've, um, Sam and several people have echoed the same thought. You've repeatedly said that you've cited the notion that, and you've quoted the Bible correctly in saying there's no other name under which um, salvation can be found than the name of Christ. But when you know a little bit of history and you know a little bit of theology, you know that the name means the power and the purpose of a thing. It's obviously not Jesus, because in, in Aramaic, Jesus is something like Yeshua, okay? So it's not the word, the sound of the word. It's the meaning of the word and the meaning of what the word stands for. And in Christian faith, that word stands for love, the fullness of the revelation of love. Now, you may not agree that Jesus was the fullness of the revelation of love. That, okay. But that's the doctrine, and it is absolutely wrong to say that, that what, what your quote was, only Catholics will get into heaven. That is absolutely wrong. There is a doctrine in the Catholic Church, and it's supported by all the major denominations, that there is such a thing as general grace. In fact, in the book of Romans, it, clearly, it says plainly, that which can be known about God is clearly perceived in the things that are made. Okay, and I, you're, you're just wrong. Okay, and when well, you can make I assertions. address this? I mean, I get wait, the spirit of your finish. objection. You, you well, uh, can I just, uh, 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 Richard, this was not a comment on your uh, speech. Uh, we need to sort of wrap this up fairly quickly, Bill. I'm sorry, but so if, if Sam can respond and so on, and then we have to get. Uh, do you have a comment? Well, I think we know what each side is, and I think that we've heard a lot from both sides, and I think that laying these ideas out here, we don't necessarily need to discuss them at length and try to prove to each other the nuances of each of our own beliefs for the next you know, five hours. I think that we can move on, that we can consider these things and that we can um, you know, take this home with us. And you know, if we need to revise our own beliefs, if we need to just study things more empirically or you know, whatever, and that we can move on and that you know, everybody has made their point that <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? Okay, but by discussing it for three more hours, are we going to convince each other that we're wrong? So, <laughs> well, no, I, th I think it's, I, let me just agree with, with the last criticism, that it's, it's very important to get our facts straight. And it's, a ve it's very important to find out what the doctrines actually are and what percentage of people believe them and what percentage of people have kind of migrated away from from a literal and rigid adherence to them and, and have uh, modulated their beliefs. Uh, and this is, there are many flavors of Christian belief, not speaking narrowly of, of Catholicism at the moment. Um, I, would, I would actually dispute your claim about the, the kind of uh, the Catholic with a small c uh, spirit of Catholicism uh, when you look at what the Pope actually says you have to believe. Uh, and, and I quoted him as recently as last week. But even if we granted that for Catholicism, it's not true for probably what 50% of the American Protestant population believes about Jesus Christ. Uh, and it is absolutely not true of what Muslims believe about Islam, uh, broadly speaking. And 
yes, I mean, the, de the details absolutely matter, and, and we would be living in a different world if our religions were slightly different. And yes, this is a matter of criticizing bad religion, uh, but my, ar my, f my argument to you further is what is good in good religion we can have without dogmatism. We can have in the spirit of scientific rationality. We can practice meditation. We can talk to people who have spent decades practicing meditation and prayer and yoga and, and perturb their nervous system to the nth degree and come back with some interesting reports about how they can modify their experience. And we can talk about how this links up with ethics and all the rest. And at no point should we think that it is wise to pretend to, to believe, to, to, to pretend to know things we don't know. That is simply the, the root of this criticism. There was a, uh, I, well, I, some of you know that one of the reasons I actually got into this kind of dual business of science and television was, was seeing The Ascent of Man in 1973. It had, how many of you saw that series? There was a scene in there at Auschwitz where, where, where Bronowski was actually in the pool at Auschwitz. And he said, it's said that science will dehumanize people and turn them into numbers. Do you remember this? That is false, tragically false. Look for yourself. This is the concentration camp and crematorium of Auschwitz. This is where people were turned into numbers. And he went on to say it was, do it was not done by gas. It was done by arrogance. It was done by dogma. It was done by ignorance when people believe that they have no, that people believe that they have absolute knowledge with no test in reality. This is how they behave. This is what men do when they aspire to the knowledge of gods. And he went on to say that science is a very human form of knowledge. We're always at the brink of the known. We can always feel forward for what is to be hoped. Every judgment in science stands on the edge of error and is personal. Science is a tribute to what we can know, although we're fallible. And in the end, he said, the words were said by Oliver Cromwell, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. So I think at the... The, at some point, we, we have to find some sort of way of resolving these issues by bringing in, certainly bringing in more data, more evidence, and so on. But um, it, plainly, the, the, the points that Sam and Richard have been raising about the urgency of the issue, I don't think Mel would, would, would contest. Well, I mean, the sky is not falling. Right. But uh, there, there are urgent problems. And I, I, once again, would associate myself with what Beatrice said uh, about how to address them. That is, you you analyze the, the good and bad things that come out of religion and, uh, and you address yourself to the bad things. Right, but she also said that you look for, look for systems that can help you get through that. So just, just to conclude this morning, there was, I wanted to ask Paul Churchland um, to talk about the whole notion of the, of, of the possible basis, uh, an evolutionary basis for morality. It's come at the end a little bit late, but um, if you could just bear with us, I'd like to hear Paul talk about this. <laughs> and about Mark Hauser's um, suggestion that we might be in some sort, sort of sense Rawlsian creatures, um, which you could perhaps explain. And why don't we okay. give you that? And then we'll take a break, and then Richard Sloan will come back, and Neil Tyson will come back, and Ramachandran will come back. Paul Churston is professor of philosophy at UC San Diego. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I promise to you on the body of Christ that I shall be brief. <laughs> Roger asked me to speak about the American philosopher John Rawls, I believe because he wanted there to be at least a brief uh, representation of the possibility of a secular ground for morality as opposed to a supernatural or a religious ground. John Rawls is certainly uh, a good choice to address that issue, and uh, I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I I have an obligation here to Dan Dennett. I've just seen his picture here, but I think I'm going to show you his picture at the end of my talk rather than at the beginning. So I will probably be appealing to his uh, wisdom at some point. John Rawls is an American philosopher. Uh, those of us who were graduate students in the mid-60s read an early paper by him called Justice as Fairness, which was the seed from which a very large book called A Theory of Justice subsequently grew. Uh, he has been one of the most influential 
um, moral slash political slash economic philosophers uh, of the last 50 years. I, I believe he recently passed away. He was, uh, he was at Harvard. And uh, the basic idea is one which I think you will find appealing. I'm going to criticize it. Uh, I give you a fair warning beforehand as secular grounds for uh, an all-encompassing morality. I don't think it's going to succeed, but uh, let's at least entertain the possibility. Rawls' move here is in the tradition that you will recognize, a tradition that attempts to ground a system of moral convictions, a system of moral, uh, political, economic practices in self-interest. But it's an unusually clever way of trying to do it. He has us imagine a rational person choosing between alternative political systems, between, say, the uh, uh, political uh, system, economic system of Soviet Russia in the uh, 50s and 60s, or the uh, liberal regulated capitalism of America, or think of any pair that might interest you, uh, the person, imagine it to be yourself, is allowed to look at these two systems and see what um, arrangements are made for the distribution of money, for the distribution of rights, for the uh, organization of society. But you are to make your choice between these competing systems from what has famously come to be called the veil of ignorance. The veil of ignorance makes you ignorant of how smart you are or how stupid you are, how high born you are or how low born you are how charming you are, uh, or how dull, how good looking, or how homely. You are kept uh, ignorant of all of these things because what Rawls wants you to be ignorant of is where you're going to be placed in this society. Are you going to be a mogul on Wall Street? Are you going to be digging ditches in Alabama? Are you going to be locked in a prison somewhere because you smoke too much marijuana? All of these things you don't know. But the basic idea is after you've made your choice and say, I go for this society, you are going to be picked up by a, a, a god and placed at random in that society. According to Rawls, the rational person will attempt to choose that society which has the kindness and most benign minimum level of well-being. It's the maximize the minimum level strategy. And it's entirely, uh, uh, at least right off the bat, it's appealing. Why would one risk uh, anything else than uh, guaranteeing that even if you happen to land in the worst possible position within this society, it'll still be bearable because all of the other alternatives were worse. That's basically the story. It is in the tradition of things that you recognize, like the do unto others as you would be done by. Uh, it makes contact with um, the sorts of intuitions that people already have, whether they're religious or not. And it has the advantage, note well, of justifying a liberal form of capitalism which allows significant uh, differences in the level of income if the payoff of allowing those differences is that all of the boats at the bottom are raised. The aim, ultimately, is to raise those bottom-most boats as high as possible. And it would be foolish, says Rawls, as the Soviet Union was foolish, to do away with significant differences in income if the result of doing that was to lower the bottom-most boats. Why would anybody do that? Well, he became, I think, justly famous for this. And the claim was that the filter of the veil of ignorance would be an effective method for allowing a purely rational being who was interested in their own welfare, but they weren't allowed to know too much about who they were. So they had to be worried about everybody's welfare because they didn't know where they were going to be stuck. This is, uh, this is a way of identifying a certain mode of social practice, a certain set of uh, political, economic, and moral rules as being uniquely rational. No appeal to transcendent gods. 
this is a way to make decisions about uh, mor moral systems, indeed economic and political systems, uh, without appealing to anything like that. Now, I, that's all the history I'm going to give you. I tell you uh, why I am not a Rawlsian, if you like. Uh, one of the reasons that us uh, philosophy students seized on this is that it did seem to be, in an entirely secular way, one which appealed to reason, uh, but not just pure reason. You had to know something about uh, economic systems and the way they would play out when the, uh, uh, the game button was pressed. But it wasn't appealing to supernatural things. It wasn't appealing to a direct moral sense that allowed you to pick out what was moral and to put aside that which wasn't moral. It was appealing. Forty years later, I think it's wrong. I think it may be a good thought experiment to motivate useful political discussion. I don't think it's a test, a litmus test for genuine morality over, uh, or genuine justice over uh, injustice. And here's why. It reminds me, first of all, of a similar move that a famous philosopher named René Descartes made in the field of natural science. René Descartes was living at a time when uh, humanity, at least in Europe, was crawling out from under the oppression of the, uh, the Dark Ages and the Catholic Church, which had pretty much, at that time, forsworn uh, interest in uh, or even tolerance of the natural sciences. And Descartes has become famous for trying to find another authority by which to evaluate adequate or correct science other than uh, the Bible uh, uh, or any other kind of authority that you'd want. And he's famous for saying it's reason and the clear and distinct apprehensions that the faculty of reason can give you. Uh, here is Descartes, who was himself responsible for many of the major advances in uh, modern mathematics. The Cartesian coordinate system is named after him. He is the fellow who algebraized uh, geometry. He's the fellow who came up with the law of conservation of momentum. Uh, he corrected uh, Galileo's um, uh, uh, law of motion and uh, then gave it to Newton. They call it Newton's uh, uh, first law, a body free of forces will move in a straight line at constant velocity. Uh, well, that isn't Newton's first law. It's dear old Descartes. So Descartes was responsible for a good deal of modern science. And his story was that he could tell which laws were genuine laws of nature by putting his faculty of reason to work, uh, contemplating the law in question. And if he could get a hold of it clearly and distinctly, then it had to be a law. Well, now, we're not tempted to buy this story that Descartes held out to us. We might have been sympathetic at the time. He was hiding out in the Netherlands, hoping to avoid the fate of uh, Giordano Bruno and uh, Galileo, uh, one of whom had been burnt at the stake and the other who was uh, put under house arrest for uh, their scientific activities. And uh, we won't accept it because we know that the reality is very different. We got to the level of scientific understanding that Descartes commanded through an awful lot of hard work that started way back with the Sumerians and the Persians and the Egyptians and the Greeks. And we climbed through some work done by uh, the uh, Arab civilization in North Africa. And we have since climbed upwards through Newton and through Einstein and into quantum mechanics, we know that the idea that there is a single litmus test that can tell you what's a true or a false scientific theory is nonsense. How can we tell the difference between good and bad theories? Well, the answer is with great difficulty. It takes long periods of historical time to accumulate evidence, to submit theories to uh, systematic tests, but we manage to learn over hundreds of years, over thousands, over, well, fives and tens of thousands of years. Now, let us come back to the moral domain. I want to suggest that uh, Rawls was wrong in exactly the same way that Descartes was. The idea that there's a simple litmus test to determine what is a valid moral rule or a just system of distributing goods in society is just as silly as Descartes' idea. What we have to do in order to get a grip on those very, very important facts is look back upon the history of the human race 
as it has come through the Persian civilization and the Egyptian civilization and the Grecian and <sighs> Renaissance, we have gone through a series, the human race, a series of experiments of living under this form of social organization, this form of uh, economic organization, this form of uh, criminal justice and distribution and so forth. And we have modified it steadily as we go, especially in countries like England and France, where you can go back 600 years, or uh, uh, in the case of Britain, 1,200 years to the, to the uh, 1,200? No, 800? To the Magna Carta. Uh, and in countries like the U.S. where you can go back 300 years and have a continuous development of common law. Just think of the judiciary, modifying how they interpret the uh, law that's been laid down. And there are steady changes in the law. The shoe often pinches. We learn that what was a good idea uh, in some people's mind, like prohibition, turns out to be a very bad idea for all of the reasons that, uh, uh, where, where, where's my friend? Got? There he is. Thank you, Mel. Um, we learn from an awful painful experience, and we slowly modify what we think is true. Now, science often plays an enormous role in all of this, and I give you uh, uh, one example which uh, bears upon the uh, struggle over uh, abortion and whether uh, a conceptus uh, is a person. It uh, used to, some people suggest, indeed I had one of my colleagues suggest to me, Paul, no factual information will settle this moral dispute between uh, uh, the pro-choice and the pro-life people on, on whether the uh, conceptus is a person. And, uh, well, what do you think, I said. Well, uh, he said, and here I think quite wisely, saying that the conceptus is like a person is like saying that an acorn is an oak tree or that an apple seed is a full-grown apple tree. He says it's just a conceptual confusion. This is a, a dear old colleague of mine, uh, um, born in the, uh, uh, the analytic tradition of uh, Oxford and Cambridge. And I said, well, that's very interesting, because here's a piece of information from the history of science having to do with seeds and why they grow into things. Did you know that 400 years ago, biology, here I'm speaking to my colleague, did you know that 400 years ago, biologists uh, uh, or alchemists or natural philosophers believed that inside each apple seed or each acorn or indeed anything along that line, there was an elan vital or a vital spirit or an archaeus, uh, to use a Latin term. There were a variety of terms for it, and it was conceived to be a spiritual thing that was already inside the acorn and already inside the apple seed and which steered the development of the acorn or the apple seed into its triumphant realization as a oak tree or an apple tree. And we learned, as a matter of scientific fact, that that isn't how it works. We can find the DNA inside seeds and inside acorns, and we've given up the dualist theory of um, uh, apples and acorns, and so nobody is seen to be guilty for destroying an entire oak forest or destroying an entire apple orchard for taking a handful of apple seeds and uh, flushing them down the toilet or taking a handful of acorns and throwing them to the local squirrel. That's not a case of mass herbicide uh, for reasons we can now defend uh, using modern science. Uh, the suggestion, of course, is that we are in the process of discovering, or we've already discovered, now we're in the process of trying to convince people in general, that a conceptus isn't any different from an apple seed or an acorn. They're already fertilized, if you like. They already contain what's needed. Now, here's an example of something we can learn from science that bears directly on a moral issue of great importance to a whole society. But it is only one example of hundreds and thousands and millions. And we are up to our neck in the learning process, even as the elections take place today. Because for the last couple of years, We've been living under one political, moral, economic uh, organization, and there are suggestions on the ballot to modify it in small ways. And this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years, indeed for thousands, indeed the process of changing the cultural matrix into which we are uh, uh, all uplifted when we're born has been going on since uh, for 100,000 years, 50,000 years anyway. 
there is this process of cultural learning, and I suggest that humanity had a detailed conception of what was moral and what was not, what was just and what wasn't, what was fair and what wasn't, that antedated by far Christianity or even Buddhism or Zoroastrianism. Uh, we have been learning slowly what are the apt, appropriate, fair, just, manageable, stable ways of organizing our collective existence for a long time. So we don't need to make it for scratch, uh, make a morality from scratch. I'm inclined to think that something like uh, Christianity or uh, Islam, uh, the doctrines that they will lay out for uh, uh, your uh, moral approval, are rationalizations written after the fact, and they're intelligible to people most, for the most part only because we already have a systematic social conscience, a systematic way of uh, social understanding. The take-home lesson here is that where morality comes from, it comes from long experience, just as that's where science comes from. It comes from long experience, and the process is slow, and the hope that you can settle something quickly by finding a touchstone which will serve you forever is something which has infected badly most of the world's major religions, but occasionally even somebody like Rene Descartes or John Rawls. I don't think it's so easy. I think it's hard. And if this is true, then dogma, which I think I agree with uh, uh, Sam Harris, is the basic problem here. The religions are just outstanding exponents of this uh, unfortunate feature. Dogma is the really uh, difficult problem here, because if you think you already have the absolute truth, whether scientific or moral, then, and it's given to you by God, then you have a problem. You can no longer learn. Absolute truth is immutable, and that is the most tragic thing at all. I think about the predations that all of the world's religions have tended to uh, visit upon the human race. In order to buy a needed authority, they bought too much, and it's self-defeating. If you are infallible, if your laws are already perfect, then you can't possibly learn anything more from experience. And that is a tragedy, because any creature that stops learning dies. Thank you very much. I am standing before you, I think, only because a certain, um, all right, Patty, I'm pressing all the buttons and nothing's happening. There we go. Uh, because a certain gentleman known to me over uh, 40, well, 30 years, Dan Dennett, uh, had a heart attack and uh, was unable to be here. There he is, having survived. Uh, I was supposed to read uh, the letter that he gave to, uh, or, or, or sent to Roger in explanation of his uh, absence. But I've since discovered that essentially everybody in the room has read it. So I'm not going to stand between you and lunch and uh, read it again. But uh, right. it is a shame, given all the wonderful people we've had here, that we didn't also have Dan, because he is a dear and a sweet man, uh, despite the uh, pr presumption against him, perhaps, for having written a book called Breaking the the spell. Paul, it's actually quite Paul, a book. could I just ask you a question? Did, yes, did, did you, can we just have a show of hands and see actually who has read it? And because if not, did, did, no, it isn't in fact very long. Did, and, and it's quite it's it's quite entertaining. I think you should read it. I think it'd be uh, then I shall. I shall. Um, I should really have Bill Calvin reading this, since he looks more like Dan than I do. But I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank goodness I'm alive. October 26, Daniel C. Dennett. A little more than a week ago, I was rushed by ambulance to the Leahy Clinic outside Boston, where it was determined by CT scan that I had a bisected aorta. The lining of the main output vessel carrying blood from my heart had been torn up, creating a two-channel pipe where there should be only one. Fortunately for me, the fact that I'd had a coronary artery bypass graft seven years ago probably saved my life, since the tangle of scar tissue that had grown like ivy around my heart in the intervening years reinforced the aorta as if it had been wound up with duct tape, preventing catastrophic leakage from the big tear in the aorta itself. 
after a nine-hour surgery in which my heart was stopped entirely and my body and brain were chilled down to about 45 degrees to prevent brain damage from lack of oxygen until they could get the heart-lung machine pumping, I am now the proud possessor of a new aorta and aortic arch made of strong Dacron fabric tubing sewn into shape on the spot by the surgeon attached to my heart by a carbon fiber valve that makes a reassuring little click every time my heart beats. I joked with the anesthesiologist who, like me, is a sailor, saying that with my new Dacron sail and carbon fiber mast, all I needed now was some stainless steel rigging to complete my transformation into a living sailboat. <laughs> You've already got it, he replied. We put in permanent stainless steel staples to close up your ribcage. <laughs> now I'm looking forward to a gentle period of recuperation and reflection provoked by the flood of supporting messages, cards, visits, and phone calls I'd received since word got out about my latest adventure. Did I have a near-death experience? Did I have any epiphany that perhaps changed my life a little about whether God or an afterlife exists? Yes, I did have an epiphany, but not along the lines some were hoping for. I saw with greater clarity than ever before in my life that when I say, thank goodness, this is not merely a euphemism for thank God. Quote, uh, uh, Sorry, parentheses. We atheists don't believe that there is any God to thank, end uh, parentheses. I really meant, thank goodness. There is a lot of goodness in the world, and more goodness every day, and this fantastic human-made fabric of excellence is genuinely and literally responsible for the fact that I am alive today. It is a worthy recipient of the gratitude I feel today, and I want to celebrate that fact here and now. To whom, then, do I owe a debt of gratitude? To Nicholas Saparisis, the cardiologist who has kept me alive and ticking for years, and who swiftly and confidently rejected the original diagnosis of nothing worse than pneumonia. To the surgeon Frank Bowen, who is heroic, uh, uh, who is heroic conscientious, and indefatigable, assisted by Provine Menon, and to the anesthesiologists Paul Teague and David Shaft, and the perfusionist Ray DePinto, who along with several neurologists kept my system going for many hours under daunting circumstances, and to Brandy Eaton and Todd Schweinwager, just two of the dozen or so physician assistants who helped postoperatively performing such tasks as pulling out of my chest the timing wires leading to my heart, left in in, play in case emergency defibrillation was required, and the four large drainage tubes, an experience that was not so much painful as simply shocking, and to a specialist cardiac nurse and regular nurse and physical therapist and x-ray traditions and a small army of phlebotomists so deaf that you hardly knew they were drawing your blood, and the people who brought the meals, kept my room clean, did the mountains of laundry generated by such a messy case, wheelchaired me to x-ray, and so forth. These people came from Uganda, Kenya, Liberia, Haiti, the Philippines, Croatia, Russia, China, Korea, and India, in addition to native-born Americans. And I have never seen more impressive mutual respect, helping each other out, checking each other's work. But for all their teamwork, this local gang could not have done their jobs without the huge background of contributions from others. I remember with gratitude my late friend and Tufts colleague, physicist Alan Cormick, who shared the Nobel Prize for his invention of the CT scanner. Alan, you have posthumously saved yet another life, but who's counting? The world is better for the work you did. Thank goodness. Then there's the whole system of medicine, both the science and the technology, without which the best intentioned efforts of individuals would be roughly useless. So I am grateful to the editorial boards and referees, past and present, of science, nature, JAMA, Lancet, and all the other institutions of science and medicine that keep churning out improvements, detecting and correcting flaws. Do I worship? Modern medicine? Not at all. There is no aspect of modern medicine that I would exempt from the most rigorous scrutiny, and I can readily identify a host of serious problems that still need to be fixed. That's easy to do, of course, because the worlds of medicine and science are already engaged in the most obsessive, intensive, and humble self-assessments yet known to human agency, and they regularly make public the results of their self-examination. You can see where he's going here. One thing in particular struck me as I compared the medical world on which my life now depended with the religious institutions I have been studying so intensively in recent years. One of the gentler, more supportive themes to be found in every religion, so far as I know, is the idea that what really matters is what is in your heart. If you have good intentions and are trying to do what is right, that is all anyone can ask. Not so in medicine. If you are wrong, especially if you should have known better, your good intentions count for almost nothing. 
And whereas taking a leap of faith and acting without further scrutiny of one's options is often celebrated by religions, it is considered a grave sin in medicine. A doctor whose devout faith in his own revelations about how to treat aortal aneurysm led him to engage in untested trials with human subjects would be severely reprimanded if not driven out of medicine altogether. In other words, whereas religions may make people more war moral than they otherwise would be, that's an open empirical question that I've been trying to find answers to. There is a higher standard to be found in the secular world of science. No religion holds its members to the high standards of moral responsibility that medicine does, exclamation point. And I'm not just talking about the standards at the top among the surgeons and doctors who make life or death decisions every day. I'm talking about the standards of conscientiousness endorsed by the lab technicians and meal preparers, too. This tradition puts its faith in the unlimited application of reason and empirical inquiry. Checking and rechecking and getting in the habit of asking, what if I'm wrong? Appeals to faith or membership are never tolerated. Imagine the reception a scientist would get if he tried to suggest that others couldn't represent, uh, replicate his results because they just didn't share the faith of the people in his lab. And to return to my main point, it is the goodness of this tradition of reason and open inquiry that I thank for my being alive today. Concluding paragraph. What, though, do I say to those of my religious friends, and yes, I have quite a lot of religious friends, who have had the courage and honesty to tell me that they've been praying for me? I have gladly forgiven them, of course, for there are few circumstances more frustrating than not being able to help a loved one in any more direct way, and I confess to regretting that I could not pray sincerely for my friends and family in need of time. I translate my religious friends' remarks readily enough into a version of what my fellow brights have been telling me. Quote, I've been thinking about you and wishing with all my heart, another ineffective but irresistible self-indulgence, that you come through this okay. The fact that these dear friends have been thinking of me in this way and have taken an effort to let me know is in itself, without any need for a supernatural boost, a wonderful tonic. I can say that these messages from my dear family and from my friends around the world uh, would have been literally heartwarming in my case, and I am grateful for the boost in morale to truly manic heights, I fear. That it, <laughs> boost in morale that it has produced in me. But I am not joking when I say that I have to forgive my friends who say that they are praying for me. I feel about that taken literally the same way I would feel if one of them said, I've just paid a voodoo doctor to cast a spell for your health, or I've been spending the afternoon in a seance hoping to contact your dead ancestors so that they can put in a good word for you with the keeper of the underworld, end quote. <laughs> Surely, though, it does no harm if those who can do so pray for me. I'm not at all sure about that. For one thing, if they really wanted to do something useful, they could devote their prayer time and energy to some pressing object that they can do something about. For another, we now have quite solid grounds, for example, the recently released Benson study at Harvard, for believing that intercessory prayer simply doesn't work. And anybody whose practice shrugs off that research is subtly undermining respect for the very goodness I am thanking. If you insist on keeping the myth of the effectiveness of prayer alive, you owe the rest of us a justification in the face of the evidence. Pending such a justification, I will excuse you for indulging in your tradition. I know how comforting tradition can be, but I don't want you to continue to think that what you were doing is morally unproblematic, unproblematic. Like tenacious scientists who resist the evidence for theories they don't like long after a graceful concession would have been appropriate, I applaud you for your loyalty to your own position, but remember, loyalty is not enough. You've got to keep asking yourself, what if I'm wrong? I think religious people can be asked to live up to the same standards as people in science and medicine. Dan Dennett. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now can I tell them that I'm not going to keep them from lunch? Well, it's, it's, there's just uh, some more coffee and... Oh, out there. So, okay. Uh, what I actually need to do, because Richard Sloan has to leave early, is I'm going to suggest that we take a brief break here. Let me just add one comment. The, 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 the Dacron sailing and the stuff and so on. I then sent an email to Dan, which said that it reminded me of Otto von Neurath's comment that science was a bit like a sailboat, a bit like a boat, that to be rebuilt had to be rebuilt plank by plank while still afloat. And I said that it seemed, perhaps, thought that perhaps that should be applied also to scientists and bearded philosophers. And I hadn't realized at the time when I said that, that that's quoted so often by Quine, who was, of course, Dan's great mentor, wasn't he? 
Uh, yes, but Dan tried to uh, break the attachment to Quine. He was, he said, uh, once said, I went to Oxford to refute Quine. But yes, Quine had an enormous influence on him. <laughs> okay. So can we take a, a very brief break now, just 15 minutes, because uh, Richard Sloan, uh, in, having just heard about prayer and its effects, I think coming back to hear Richard Sloan on this will be very apposite. So could we get back here in about 15 minutes?